is combinatorial theory, graph theory, and additive combinatorics. Right. So the course website is up there, so all the course information is on there. So after around the middle of the class, I'll say a bit more about various course information, administrative things, but I want to jump directly into the mathematical content. Right. So this course roughly has two parts. The first part will look at graph theory, in particular ex problems in extremal graph theory. And the second part will transition to additive combinatorics. But these are not two separate subjects. Right? So I want to show you this topic in a way that connects these two areas and show you that uh, they are quite related to each other. And many of the common themes that will come up in one part of the course will also show up in the other. So the story between graph theory and additive combinatorics began about 100 years ago with Schur, the famous mathematician, Isaac Schur. Well, he was, like many mathematicians of his era, trying to prove Fermat's last theorem. And so here's what Schur's approach. He said, well, let's look at this equation that comes up in Fermat's last theorem. And well, one of the methods of elementary number theory to rule out solutions to an equation is to consider what happens when you mod p. Right? If you can rule out for infinitely many values p, possible non-trivial solutions to this equation mod p, then you will rule out possibilities of solutions to Fermat's last theorem. Right? Okay, so this was Scherer's approach. Uh, as you can guess, unfortunately, this approach did not work. And Schur proved that this method definitely doesn't work. Right? So that's the starting point of our discussion. So it turns out that for every value of n, there exists non-trivial solutions for all p sufficiently large. So thereby ruling out the strategy. Okay, so let's see how Schurz proved his theorem. So that will be the first half of today's lecture. Okay. So this seems like a number theory question. So what does it have to do with graph theory? So I want to show you this connection. Now, Schur deduced his theorem from another result that is known as well, Schur's theorem, which says that if the positive integers is colored using finitely many colors, then there exists a monochromatic solution to the equation x plus y equals to z. If you give me 10 colors and color the positive integers using those 10 colors, then I can find for you a solution to this equation where x, y, and z are all of the same color. Now, this statement, okay, so it's a perfectly understandable statement, but let me rephrase it in a somewhat different way. And this gets to a point that I want to discuss where many statements in additive combinatorics or just combinatorics in general, have uh, different formulations. One that comes in an infinitary form, which is more qualitative, so to speak, and another form that is known as finitary, and that's more quantitative in nature. So Schur's theorem is stated in a infinitary form. So it tells you if you color using finitely many colors, then there exists a monochromatic solution. So many, but not all, statements of that form have an equivalent finitary form that is sometimes more useful. And also, once you state the right finitary form, you can ask additional questions. So here's what Schur's theorem looks like in the equivalent finitary form. Okay. 
you give me an R, for every R, there exists some N function of R such that if the numbers 1 through N, so throughout this course I'm going to use this bracket N to denote integers up to N. So if these numbers are colored using our colors, then necessarily there exists a monochromatic solution to the equation x plus y equals to z, where x, y, and z are in the set that is being colored. Okay, so it looks very similar to the first version I stated. Um, the following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. The following content is provided under Okay, we're going to get going. Now, we have a small class this year because of changes in the institute with pass-fail types of things, but uh, Professor Martin and Dr. Sin Dr. Ray and I consider this to be a special opportunity for us to run the course a little bit differently uh, with a few more quirks and surprises uh, because we have a small number of you. We can listen to you all. We can get input from you. We can even get feedback from you of something you might like to see more of. And in general, we really want I capture the sense of you. I, I've looked at the registration list. We have people from every year. We have people from many, many different disciplines. So this is what we're going to do today after we, I start doing some introductions and so on. We're going to talk about the nitty gritty of the organization. We need to tell you this. We need to convey this information to you clearly about when exams are and what requirements are and how to do well in this course without even realizing it, that kind of thing. And then I'll um, take you through this sort of fast track through molecules to man all the way down to cells and organisms to show you that there was a break point in the 1950s where the, where the structure, the non-covalent structure of DNA was elucidated. And there was an entire revolution after that, which makes modern biology, the study of modern biology, so entirely different from the study of biology in the era before that. Biology used to be considered taxonomy and dissection, like listing and, and looking at. But now biology, modern biology, is a molecular science. So as we talk about these topics, what you will see is the blueprints for life are common 
across domains of life. And if you learn basic principles, you'll have an exponential increase in your ability to appreciate these characteristics. That modern biology is a synthesis of science, technology, engineering, where all the tools from those disciplines, different disciplines, physics, math, computation, funnel into modern biology to make what we know now feasible. And that, that's a dramatic and a fantastic opportunity for all of you moving forward in your careers. Uh, now, I want to introduce the team. So I'm Barbara Imperiali. I'm a faculty member in chemistry and biology, and I'm really interested in uh, chemical biology, glycobiology, biophysics. I love to tease apart complex pathways in organisms where we, you synthesize, biosynthesize very unusual glycoconjugates that that are very important for cell-cell communication and host-cell pathogen communication, for example. I was trained as an organic chemist. In fact, I did my PhD degree at MIT about five million years ago on a sort of current scale. So uh, uh, my co-instructor is Professor. This is, sorry about this, but they want us on the Oh. Hello, I'm Professor Martin, and uh, my lab is interested in how cells generate mechanical forces and how this is involved in sculpting tissues during development. So what Adam hasn't told you is he's a cell biologist, a biophysicist, and he's a lot better at genetics than I am. Uh, our instructor is Dr. S uh, Divya Ray, who's been with this course. Now this is the sixth year, and she is trained in immunology, uh, cancer biology, and also cell cellular signaling. But what you can't tell from that is how dedicated she is to each and every one of you. If you have any trouble in the semester, just contact Dr. Ray and say, I need some help, be it, you know, a particular problem in the material or there's just something come up that makes it difficult for you to do your best in the course. She will help you. She'll work out mechanisms to get you through troubled spots. So let's get going here. Now, um, what I want to try to do is just give you sort of a flavor of where we're going to within the course by starting with a few sort of uh, bullet points and topics just that I can sort of pique your interest. So as I mentioned before, studying biology in the 21st century is a fabulous opportunity. No matter what discipline you come from, you can add to the expertise that will move biology forward. Biology would not be where it is today in the absence of science engineering to promote it and to support progress in biology. So you really want to realize that, that you have an opportunity. You may say, well, I'm, I'm in this discipline or other. I don't think biology is going to have anything to do with my future career, or, uh, career opportunities. But it has a lot to do with your life. It has a lot to do with understanding health and disease, understanding new scientific discoveries and developments. So it's so important that you, as a sort of a scholar of the 21st century, have a good grasp on these materials. And we're not trying to feed you anything dull and boring. This is really exciting stuff because the level of complexity that we can study nowadays, whole genomes, whole organisms at a molecular level is amazing. It's amazing. We're not just peering down a slide and looking at you know, one cell or something. We would be able to do full descriptions. So um, the, uh, what we'll try to give you is a view of the fundamental principles that are common to all living organisms. So the study of biology, some people a microbiologist or eukaryotic biologist or human biologist or, vir or they study virology. But we're going to build for you in the first uh, few weeks of class information on the common building blocks that are go across all domains of life. Because once you start to learn about those molecules, the build up, the macromolecules of life, then you'll start to really gain an understanding how amazing it is that these same sets of molecules function across from bacteria to man. So you learn the rules for the simplest organisms. You look at the molecules and you see how form fulfills function 
which is something I'm really excited about. And then you'll be able to apply it as we get ever more complex systems um, which, which demand a lot of attention. Um, so these are common molecular, there's a common molecular logic of very complex processes. Motivations, I just mentioned a few. Sure, you want to understand uh, health and disease. Uh, you want to understand what might be going on with current therapies when you have a, a, a relative who's been diagnosed with a serious disease. What are the current opportunities? What's coming down? What sorts of opportunities for therapy might be available? Because there are so many diseases now we understand at a molecular level. We may not understand how to treat them yet, but we understand what their origin is, and that's why molecular approaches are so important. Um, uh, you may often hear words like systems biology and synthetic biology. These are kind of jazzy words for fairly straightforward things. Systems biology is a little bit like treating an organism or a cell as a, an electrical network, a wiring diagram, what, what proteins talk to what proteins, what are downstream functions, where are signals amplified and so on. So that's systems biology at its heart, quantifying different intermediates in a complex map of the cell. Synthetic biology is about using biology to make stuff, which is really cool. Many, many important molecules can be made in the lab, but it's so much more effective to make them in an organism. People are doing what they call synthetic biology, and that's exploiting and harnessing nature to make things that are useful for mankind. Um, uh, uh, and all the way through what I just want to emphasize, how integrating technology and engineering for science is really what we're all about here, because we appreciate we couldn't make the progress without it. There are also issues, bio, general biology impacts, that are in the social sciences and uh, um, impinge on things like ethics, designer babies, cloning people, cloning your pets, all kinds of things, treating a disease um, through genetics or not, uh, CRISPR Cas, some of these new innovations. But you really need to understand ethical issues related to them to be able to explain to your parents or your grandparents or your sister or brother who hasn't taken biology what the implications of some of the things that we can do in biology but probably we shouldn't do in biology. And, and we will welcome your thoughts on some of that later on. Okay, so where did the world start? Um, arguably four and a half billion years ago is kind of a vague theme, but it started with the world, the earth being a ball of fire, and it took quite a while for it to cool down to establish the hydrosphere and the, the, the globe as it's known today. There was a period of time known as the prebiotic world where there were not living organisms that replicated. And that uh, was basically a, a world where building blocks started to evolve out of mud, fiery hot mud pits and in volcanoes and goodness knows what, where people believe that the building blocks of life, just the molecules, came together from things like hydrogen cyanide or sulfide or other uh, primordial components that were in the primordial soup. There was a phase known as the pre-RNA the pre, uh, the pre -RNA world where the RNA building blocks were around. There's reasonable arguments in favor of the RNA world where a lot of functions were catalyzed not by proteins but by nucleic acids, specifically ribonucleic acids. So there's a period of time still pre prebiotic that had the R, um, excuse me, uh, that had the, the R, um, first pre-RNA and then RNA world. But then things really started to get interesting when the first cells um, evolved. Now, I will talk a little bit about this um, in the next class because the thing that's critical to be able to build a cell is to be able to build a wall around it. So very, very early on in life, lipid bilayers, membranes, evolved in order to make compartmentalized structures where you could differentiate the in from the out. And so much of life is completely reliant on the fact that we're made of cells. We're not just one big sort of 
bucket of water with things floating around in it because so much of function becomes coordinated by cellular compartmentalization through things known as lipid bilayers, which are semi-permeable membranes. Oxygen can move across. Some small hydrophobic things can move across, but a lot of things get either stuck in or stuck out. So we'll talk a lot about that. So the first prokaryotes were cyanobacteria. They're photosynthetic bacteria. It was um, quite a long time until those unicellular organisms that totally lacked a nucleus, lacked a lot of intracellular compartmentalization, evolved to eukaryotes. And those cells are different. They're a hundred or a thousand times bigger. They're complex, they're compartmentalized, they can do a lot of functions. In a full organism, they're very differentiated um, and they, uh, they may look different in muscle or in heart or in skin or in bone. And so those um, eukaryotes, so that's a long gap of time, but there was a lot going on in that phase. And about a half a billion years ago, multicellular life evolved. And multicellular life now can be looked at, if we think of the evolution of Homo sapiens, can be thought of as something that uh, we can keep track of a bit through fossil records over the last five million years, where the first humanoid life evolved. Then you got sort of to a stage, I think he's Homo agaster, this sort of Shrek-like person um, evolved quite early on. And then um, the humanoid gradually became uh, different, evolved. In some cases, there were branches of the tree of evolution and dead ends. In other places, there was a branch that carried on for a while. For example, the Neanderthal and Homo sapiens kind of kept on evolving for a while. But there's a lot of developments that have been characterized from the fossil record. But now there's a lot of belief that um, if we trace things back through genomes, we might get more precise information on steps in evolution. Now, the evolution of the advanced, if you will, uh, hominids, um, really came along with a number of things. There was a stage at which a particular gene, the FOXP gene, is attributed to the ability to, for complex speech. And that could have been a leap forward when humanoids could communicate more. And it seems to be associated with that. But there are other sort of sociological functions like burying the dead or making jewelry or making tools that are associated with the more evolved organisms. Uh, there are other types of things like uh, cranial capacity, standing upright, looking forward. A lot of things came through those years of, of the evolution of Homo sapiens. Um, so it's fascinating to think about that and to think what light genetics can shed on those five million years of evolution. Uh, now, um, the, the world of biology took a mega kickstart with the elucidation of the human genome, but more importantly, of the technology necessary to solve the map of the whole human genome. And in, in 2001, there was major development with the publication of the first map of the human genome. It's fascinating to think with humans, we, uh, humans have about three billion genes, but there's only a cross human, is that right? No, sorry, base pairs, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, but across uh, humankind, there's, that's accounted for by only about 0.1% of, of the diversity. So, you know, you can see people look very, very different, but we still share 99.9% .9 of our genome. Another very interesting thing is that genomes vary in size quite considerably. Um, uh, before I move forward, I just want to quickly show you this map um, I mentioned um, looking uh, at tracing uh, evolution through a molecular clock, so looking back in time, not by following the shape of a skull, for example, or physiologic changes, but looking at genomes, using the genome as a molecular clock, based on mutation rates that are fairly constant amongst domains of life. You couldn't compare a human and a bacterium, but you can go back through a lot of eukaryotic evolution and see where divergences happen. So in this sort of map, you can see that human and Neanderthal diverge diverged from the chimpanzee a certain time ago, which had diverged from the gorilla further ago, based on the molecular clock that's available. Okay, 
So now I want to talk a little bit more about getting into the details of the genome. Uh, so genomes differ greatly in size. Our genome includes about 3 billion base pairs in our 22 chromosomes plus the X and Y chromosome. But the typical uh, genome of a model bacterium is only 5 billion, million base pairs. So far, far smaller, more tangible, more easy to study because uh, those genes are more limited in size. Uh, but the, the genome size is not necessarily proportionate to the number of genes that are expressed and made into proteins. And a fascinating um, discovery is that of the three billion base pairs, only about one and a half to two percent actually code for proteins. And there's a ton of interest now in what's the rest of the genome doing there. Where did it come from? What's its function? There are different functions that Eric Lander calls the dark matter of the genome different functions to the rest of the genome, but the part that we focus on is the part that gets encoded into proteins that form the functions of the molecules of life. So we're going to focus ourselves in on those. But here you see uh, differences in sizes of genomes based on base pair. But what's fascinating is despite this huge breadth of sizes and huge differences in organisms, the building blocks are the same. And that's what I think is the, the wonderful part of what we're able to teach you, is we can take you from the 1950s, when the structure of double-stranded DNA was first solved. Now, there were 60, 70 or more years of work before that, where they figured out the pieces. They figured out the chemistry, the covalent bonds in the bases and the sugars and the phosphodiester. But they had no clue how the DNA could encode uh, and program the synthesis of a protein. But once the, the, C, the structure, the three-dimensional structure of double-stranded DNA was solved, this is this beautiful anti-parallel structure that you see here by Watson, Crick, and Rosalind Franklin, then the clues came pouring in. Without that structure, without the structure of what's known as the non-covalent structure, not the covalent structure, you'll see all those building blocks, but the non-covalent structure, how you could zipper apart the two strands of DNA and make copies of both of them and replicate DNA and then go forward. That was an amazing step forward. And for that, there was a Nobel Prize awarded. Unfortunately, it was after Franklin's death, so it was um, given to uh, Watson and Crick and the third person. Now, here's that structure of DNA. A I could sort of watch it for hours, to be honest. The phosphodiester background, backbone going up the back, and the bases, base pairing across. And these are the key steps that happened from the 50s. So in the, the after the definition of the double-stranded structure, it took a few years, but they cracked the, what's known as the genetic code. How does that DNA get converted into a protein. What happens is you make an RNA copy of the DNA, and the RNA is read to make a protein. And you will learn about all those components. But that was another real landmark. Then what was really exciting is that some technology companies started figuring out, first there were very slow ways to sequence DNA, but in, uh, that, and that happened in 1977. But what was really important is about a decade later, where the ability to sequence DNA was not done anymore using huge agarose gels and a bucket of radioactivity, but it was done through using fluorescence in order to uh, allow you to read out the sequence of DNA, and you will learn about that. Um, and in 1987, the instruments were commercialized. Major, major technology and engineering. We wouldn't be anywhere without that. In 1990, the Human uh, Genome Project began. In 01, the draft of the human genome sequence was completed. Uh, 2010, you could sequence a single strand of DNA, one molecule of DNA. And now there's so many initiatives that have come out of that and so much amazing technology that is involved. So things like uh, the Thousand Genome Project to look at variation across man. So all people from all different parts of the world, you can look up that website, that's very cool. Um, the Human Cell Atlas, there was quite a bit of news about that in uh, MIT Technology News, where um, Aviv Regev is playing a major part in that, to actually sequence representatives from all of your 
trillions of cells and see how they differ. Um, uh, and then there's cancer genome uh, projects and precision medicine. Sequence every type of cancer cell, find out what's different about it, and precisely figure out how to treat it. All very exciting things. And then, of course, there's synthetic genomes where you can literally build a cell and its genome, program it to do what you want hopefully. And then there's one of the things that your generation will have to deal with, and that's all the data, because uh, we, we've just found ways to churn it out, but you guys are going to have to do the heavy lifting there. So uh, DNA, then um, looking at that structure, is packaged into cells. So figure this one out. Each human cell has 1.8 meters of DNA in it, yet it fits into a cell that's 10 to 100 microns in diameter, and it's bundled tightly up. So you'll learn how DNA in cells gets bundled up and wrapped around proteins that neutralize the negative charges of the double-stranded DNA with positively charged proteins and enable packaging. So we will talk about all of this. When is DNA unraveled? What signals it's unraveling? because in order to copy it, you've got to unpack it. So these are a lot of details about DNA that you'll be able to sort of have much more sense of as we move forward. Uh, cells are different in size. I just mentioned to you uh, a typical eukaryotic cell is about 10 to 100 microns in diameter. A typical bacterial cell is about 1 to 10 microns. So there's a vast difference in sizes for these sim simple cells that have no nucleus relative to the cells uh, that are compartmentalized and perform a lot of functions. So we will learn to appreciate that difference in size, looking at the building blocks that go into all of them, but then understanding how bigger cells have to have a lot more complexity in their signaling in order to establish their functions, but also interact with other cells in multicellular organisms. Um, we're still doing fine for time, yes. Uh, the other thing that we will uh, spend several classes on is imaging and visualization of things going on in cells. So what we'll talk to you about is the discovery of fluorescent proteins, which have provided an unparalleled opportunity to label proteins within living organisms in order to track what they do. And through the efforts of protein engineers, there is an entire panel of colored proteins that fluoresce at different wavelengths that we can use to study biology in live systems in real time. These slides show you a little bit of that. I love these pictures, just showing a dividing cell where the chromosomes you see red because the histones are labeled with red fluorescent protein and all that green fuzzy stuff of microtubules around. We can do this. Now, you couldn't do this 15 years ago, observe these changes. We can also look at changes as cells divide and go through the cell cycle. One of my favorites uh, is this, where uh, going through the stages to program a cell to divide, a new protein gets made and then it settles down. But then when you go to divide again, you, you keep making, you cyclically make different sets of proteins and you can observe them in real time dividing. So just think if you were trying to make a chemotherapeutic where you wanted to stop cell division or you wanted to inhibit one of those proteins, you could literally watch it function. Does it get into cell? Does it disrupt the normal pattern of cell division? So these are uh, capabilities that are now really um, are, uh, available. So I've talked to you about cells, but I'm gonna pass you over to Professor Martin now for a little bit. You'll get a little bit of a sense of and then I'll do the wrap up. Okay, thank you. So this is one of my favorite model organisms. This is a fruit fly uh, at a larger than real size. And so um, one topic that I'll start on when I uh, start lecturing either at the end of this month or beginning of October is we'll talk a lot about genetics, and one thing we'll start on is pioneering research done in this system to establish the chromosome theory of inheritance, okay? And we'll talk about the importance in model organisms in discovering new biology, 
But in addition to that, I also want to talk about how genetics will affect you guys as you go on and graduate from MIT and go into your own careers. Because genetics is really playing an important role in all our lives. And already, you guys have the option to get your DNA genotyped, right? There are lots of companies now, like 23andMe and Ancestry.com, where you can get your DNA genotyped and you can learn about your ancestry. You can learn about whether you might be predisposed towards certain diseases. And so in order to appreciate uh, the data you get back from these companies, you really have to understand something about genetics. And another thing which I find very fascinating are ethical issues that come up with the use of such sites. And you might have seen this in the news last semester. Um, both forensic ex experts and police identified a suspect in a killing that happened 40 years ago. And this was in part due to um, using the suspect's family tree, OK? And so they used the family tree. You know, some, you know this guy's relatives had done one of these Ancestry.coms, and they used the information from DNA acquired from other individuals to track down this other individual, OK? So one thing that I find incredibly exciting about biology is that it is truly dynamic, OK? And this is a human neutrophil, and it's just a bright field microscopy. Nothing's labeled. And what you're seeing here is this, this neutrophil is chasing after this bacterium. And it illustrates another concept that we'll talk about in this course, which is signaling. So this neutrophil is receiving a signal from this bacteria that tells it where it is. And it's then able to chase that bacterium and track it down. And there you see it just got the bacterium. OK? So we'll talk about dynamic processes that cells do and, and how that's important for their function. In addition to considering single cells, we also want to understand how entire organisms and tissues work. And I want to emphasize that, yes, we have sequenced or researchers have sequenced the hum human genome and the genomes of many different organisms, OK? And that's great, right? We have this, this data set, but we still don't understand how all the components that are in the genome are wired together and work in order to create a complicated organism like ourselves, OK? And so one aspect of that which is mysterious is how does the genome encode shape, OK? How do we get our shape and how do we get the shape of our organs? And this is something that my lab is interested in. And so this is a fruit fly embryo. And you can see at the beginning here, this is three hours into development. You just have a smooth surface for this embryo. But during development, this changes. And if I'm just showing you here a cross section of the same embryo. You see it's a sheet of cells that surrounds a central yolk. OK, and this changes three hours into development because a population of about 1,000 cells in this organism fold to form a crease, OK? So this is a dramatic shape change for this embryo. It goes from being a single layer to now having multiple layers. So this is a time course here showing you how cells change shape in this tissue and how this leads to what's initially a single layer of cells to become two layers of cells. And this process is similar to uh, morphogenetic events that happen in human embryos, but we can study this in fruit fly embryos or many other model systems in order to try to understand mechanistically how this happens. So again, this is dynamic, and I want to show you a movie that shows you the dynamics of this process. So now this is an embryo that's been labeled with some of these fluorescent proteins that Professor Imperiali just introduced. 
One's green, that's the, and it's showed here in green, and the other is a red fluorescent protein in red. The red fluorescent protein is marking individual cells. The green protein is a motor protein that generates force. And what you see is where the, the motor protein is, this is where the tissue contracts, and this is where the tissue folds, okay? And so because we're able to see these proteins in action, we can infer how they're functioning during development to uh, essentially program tissue shape. And there are many other opportunities where even though we have the genome, we still don't understand how collectives of proteins or collectives of cells are sort of interacting with each other to sort of create emergent properties that are what are responsible for patterning, patterning is something as large as a human. Another thing that we'll talk about is how cells divide. And this is another fruit fly embryo, and it's labeling uh, histones, so it labels the DNA. And so you're seeing nuclei here divide sequentially. There'll be one more division, and then it's going to stop, OK? And my point here is that cell division during development and in adults is under exquisite control, OK? And a breakdown of this control is important in the progression of cancer. So we're going to talk about how cells control whether or not they divide and how this um, is impacted in cancer cells. I also want to point out that this video is uh, from Eric Wishaus, who is uh, uh, at Princeton University. Okay, I'm gonna just hit the lights. I have one last thing just to mention. So I just wanna reinforce what Professor Imperiali said. We have a small class. So this is really an opportunity to have this be more interactive than it would be if we had like 300 people in the class. So I wanna really encourage you guys to um, ask questions. Also, if you have ideas, we would love to hear them. And I want to try one new thing this semester. Um, so I find that students are a little hesitant to come to my office hours. So this year, I want to hold what I'm calling running hours. So one thing that I really like to do is I like to run. And um, I, I've noticed that many of my students are also runners because I'll like see them out or around the river. And so, I just want to hold sort of weekly running hours. I'm going to choose 3 o'clock, not three-hour run. All right, 3 p.m. on Fridays. And we'll just meet in my office. And so if you like to run, you can just meet there. We'll go on a run around the Charles. And this is not a competitive event. I'm not some fitness nut. I ran home last week, and I ate half a bag of Swedish fish on the way. So it's not a competition. It's just to try to get to know you guys and to try to break the ice in sort of a non-academic way. OK, so I'm just going to wrap up here. Um, so we bombed you with a, quite a lot of, yes, over there. You want to know more about running? <laughs> yeah, or you could join me at CrossFit if you would like as well. Um, uh, we will both have office hours and we will post them and we welcome you to come visit us and, you know, find out more, tell us more about yourselves. Uh, we, we've, we are fountains of information. Uh, so basically over the first half of the course we tend to cover foundations and so we build on biochemistry one of my favorite subjects where we cover all of the molecules of life what are all the bits it takes to make a cell lipids sugars proteins nucleic acids then we synthesize them all together where we show in molecular biology how the genome encodes 
the proteome and what happens to the proteome after that. So you'll see me for all of those lectures. Then I will hand you over to Professor Martin for genetics, uh, for the um, learning how to manipulate DNA. And we'll cap off this first phase of work with cell signaling and understanding much more about dynamics of cells as opposed to static building blocks. But you've got to understand the building blocks before you can understand the complexity. That's that's why I really like to cover those molecules uh, at, a, at a reasonable depth. It's kind of ridiculous, four classes, but nevertheless, that's how we start. For some of you, you've seen some of it before. For others, you've seen none of it before. It doesn't matter. We will, we will give you our flavor on it. If your chemistry is a little weak, I suggest you read the textbook. There's a couple of sections on just chemical covalent and non-covalent bonding that you'll need to do the first P set. If your chemistry is strong, you're fine. If your chemistry is weak and you need a little help, I'll run an extra session next week. We can take care of every eventuality because you're a smaller class. Um, and then um, we'll take it from there. And then what I really want to do um, is encourage you to do the reading, uh, make sure you're in a recitation, and next time, but it's in the sidebar, I'd like you to take a look at the sliding scale, which shows you the dimensions of molecules, macromolecules, and organisms, which I find uh, rather cool, even though it's probably built for high school students. Okay, that's it from us for now. So what I want to do today is just very, I want to introduce this to you very quickly, is, um, and I was gonna show you this at the, other, uh, at the end of the last class, if we simply go to the far end of the scale, the picometer scale, you see carbon. I'm not gonna start you with carbon, that is a little dull, but over the next few weeks, a uh, few classes rather, because we have to do this in fast order, we will go from, uh, we will cover uh, details of carbohydrates, amino acids, nucleosides, and phospholipids, and how those building blocks are put together, their properties, their ability to interact and engage um, in non-covalent interactions with other molecules, and, and um, the ability to make polymers out of some of these, such as the nucleosides and the amino acids and the carbohydrates, which then start to create the richness of life. We will also discuss today the supramolecular chemistry of phospholipids as they make micelles and lipid bilayers, which are the key uh, boundary of cells. So it's very important. And then in the following week, we'll go to some of the, the bigger things like proteins, uh, uh, nucleic acid, polymers, for example, here's uh, RNA. So the course will literally do this take you from one end of the scale to the other. So I want you to get a sense of um, these dimensions. I want to mention one sort of fairly stupid thing with respect to how chemists and biochemists talk about certain metrics, certain distances that are pertin pertinent to, the bio uh, to biology and biochemistry. Um, engineers tend to talk about micrometers and nanometers. Uh, there is one unit that chemists and biologists use quite a lot. It's the Armstrong. After um, a Finnish or Sw no, not Finnish. Uh, uh, I think it was a, a Norwegian, and that is equivalent. Ten Armstrong equals one nanometer. So when you're looking at scales, we tend to talk about Armstrong because they're a convenient number. 
but don't uh, don't get fooled by this. It's a, you know it can be a little bit confusing because it's ten to ten to the negative ten. So nanometers ten to the negative nine. You know that quite frequently. Picometer ten to the negative twelve. Micrometer negative six. But the angstrom is just a funny unit we use a lot, and it's ten to the negative ten. So just to make sure there's no ambiguity about that uh, that particular detail. Okay. All right, so today's uh, lecture will focus on the molecules of life, and in particular, I'm going to, through the next few classes, introduce you to the various molecules of life. But first of all, we have to do a little bit to understand chemical bonding, and in particular, we want to look at both covalent and non-covalent bonding, because covalent bonding is important, it's the structure, it's the framework, but non-covalent bonding is what gives us dynamics. These are much weaker forces that can be broken and remade very readily that are essential for things like forming the DNA duplex, for folding your proteins, for um, associating the lipid bilayer. All of those are non-covalent forces, and they are dynamic because they're weak. You can break one relatively easily as long as you're ready to make another one in its place. So um, I will spend a little bit of time on that, and then today we'll talk about lipids and membranes. But first of all, let me introduce you to some of the molecules of life in this rendition that's done by David Goodsell at Scripps. So up in the top corner here, you look at 2.3, is the three-dimensional structure of a protein. It's folded into a globular state through uh, uh, non-covalent forces. I brought a little uh, 3D model of a protein for you to look at and uh, take a look at later. That was one of the suggestions I made. You could coordinate printing a 3D model as your, one of your later projects. Um, we will learn about the forces that hold the polymer together, the covalent forces, but then the, the non-covalent forces that make globular structures that are very important for function. They're not much use as unraveled spaghetti. They're way more useful as their three-dimensional structure. Um, down here in the corner is a carbohydrate. It really looks pretty pathetic in this rendition, but carbohydrates have a lot of value, particularly in energy storage, but also in things like the extracellular matrix and as entities that signal information between cells. There's a lot of communication done by cell surface carbohydrates. Over here, you see the canonical structure of double-stranded DNA. We'll look at the covalent structure of those single strands, but then we'll focus in on the non-covalent interactions that make the double-stranded DNA and store genetic information, which is also central to life. And then lastly on this, but we'll cover this today, is a lipid bilayer. It's a fascinating supramolecular structure that really is at the heart of how all your cells are held in a compartment surrounded by a lipid bilayer. So by the time we start talking about those, you'll understand the forces that put in place that lipid bilayer that arguably, and I've read articles that say this, that is the evolution of lipid bilayers is as important as the genetic code because if cells did not have a surrounding, did not have an inside where you could concentrate reagents and macromolecules and do biochemistry, we wouldn't exist as we, life wouldn't exist in the same way. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at the composition of uh, living systems. And uh, remarkably, we are about <laughs> 75% water. So most proteins are very hydrated. There's a lot of water in cells. There's a lot of water outside of cells in the matrix. And really, we, we sort of survive. We, we survive in an aqueous environment. And the thing that you also want to think about is when we think about non-covalent forces, these are forces put in place in water. We don't live in a, on a far distant planet where we're in sort of liquid methane or anything like that. So water is critical to life. Uh, the establishment of the hydrosphere when Earth, f Earth first formed, the evolutionary events that happened after that were, to, were really in hand in hand with the fact that it was an aqueous environment. Because forces are different whether they are in hydrophobic environments or hydrophilic environments. And uh, really you'll start to get appreciation for that as we move forward. So this basic suggests that if I put one of you in a giant desiccator and pumped out all the water I could possibly pull out, there'd be about sort of, depending on your weight, 
40 pounds of things left behind, of what's left behind. The majority of it is going to be biological macromolecules, whoops. And then the rest of it, that little slither, are things like ions and small molecules, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, those, uh, those small inorganic ions, as well as small molecule metabolites that are involved in central metabolism. Let's go now look at the macromolecules and their sort of proportions relative to each other. The smallest slither are the lipids, which we'll talk about today. Then you have the nucleic acids that are critical for information storage. You have proteins, which make the largest piece of the pie, and the carbohydrates, which are um, one of the, uh, is the 25%. So you can see how important carbohydrates are because of their proportion being relatively large. The lipid proportion, though, is small, but absolutely critical, harking back to the membrane bilayer, because if we didn't have the membrane bilayer, once again, we wouldn't have life in the same way that we have it now. So that gives you a sense of, uh, of the relative proportions of things. And frankly, when I discuss the macromolecules, I really like to start with lipids because of the membrane bilayer, but because their structures are comparatively simple relative to amino acids and nucleic acids. So we can get a few of the basics of the chemical structures down and how we render them uh, on paper so that we can do that with lipids, which are a little simpler. Now, life, um, to, an, to a chemist, they have to sort of worry about this entire mess of the periodic table. But the good news for you is, for biological systems, we deal with very focused components of the periodic table. So those biological macromolecules are made up largely of only six elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. So that makes your, your the amount of stuff you need to know about basic covalent structures way more simple than it is for the average chemist who has to worry about everything down here in the nether regions and whoops, what are you doing? Uh, and the things that are things that are radioactive, all kinds of other things. You don't have to worry about any of that. So the covalent bonding we will talk about is um, amongst those six different elements. Uh, and they make up 98% of the cellular mass. And then the other components that are important in cells are some metal ions, the alkali and alkali earth um, uh, elements, so sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, those are all quite important in life. And then these transition metal ions that are really important in enzyme catalysis, for example, but we will not cover very much of that. But those are what are known as trace elements that are very, uh, as um, transition metal elements that are very important for biochemistry. And then last of all, there are some rogue ones that there's even smaller amounts in physiologic systems. These are things like chromium, molybdenum, and tungsten, selenium, and iodine. And of those, certain of these elements only are found in totally bizarre organisms. So for example, uh, you and I don't have much molybdenum and tungsten, I don't think, unless it slipped in there by accident. But you and I definitely need selenium and iodine as trace elements. Does anyone know where iodine comes and figures most prominently? Yeah. Thyroid, absolutely. So the thyroid hormone is a small organic molecule with uh, several iodines in it. And we need, absolutely need iodine in our diet in order to build the thyroxine hormone that, pro that, that deals with a lot of aspects of metabolism. So we, we don't need a lot. And if we get too much, it's bad for you, but we definitely need traces of these elements. Now, um, I will spend um, a very small amount of time just laying down the basics of organic chemistry bonding. Now, who of you have either taken the chemistry GIR or had high school chemistry quite recently? Is that pretty much all of you? And now, if you didn't put your hand out, don't worry. We're here to bring you up to speed if you need it. Frankly, if you just know what's on the next two, two or three slides, you're in great shape. All the information that you need has been condensed. But if it's a little bit out of nowhere, you could come see me in office hours, and I can just run through things to, for you, and we can just get you up to speed. There is no need for pre-knowledge. I just need an idea of how much pre-knowledge you have. So when we talk about covalent bonding and start to think about the, the elements that are critical for life, it's important to consider the electronic structures of these elements 
and why, this, why they happen to be the chosen elements, okay? The most important thing about hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur is they love to make covalent bonds. A lot of metal ions form salts, you know, sodium chloride or many other different salts, but covalent bonds are the main structure of our macromolecules. Strong bonds between elements such as these six, in particular these six, where they share electrons in covalent bonds rather than form ionic interactions where somebody gives an electron to someone else and you have a plus minus type interaction. So these shared bonds are important for life. So it's good to understand why hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen and then phosphorus and sulfur are so important. In order to understand the covalent bonding of these elements, um, it's useful to know the electronic configuration, but you could live without that. The most important the important thing is that covalent bonds, such as the one between carbon and hydrogen here, re reflects a shared pair of electrons, one from the hydrogen, one from the carbon, to make a stable covalent bond. Because of its electronic configuration, carbon is neutral when it has four covalent bonds. Nitrogen is neutral when it has three covalent bonds, but there's an extra lone pair of electrons that are not forming bonds in neutral nitrogen and oxygen is neutral when it has two covalent bonds. These could be with hydrogen, they could be with carbon, they could be with uh, several of the other elements. For carbon, we don't deal with charged states of carbon because they're pretty high energy. They may be high energy intermediates in an enzyme catalyzed reaction, but they're not sitting there as high energy intermediates in your macromolecules. Uh, the, the key thing you want to notice is for all of these elements, the valence shell is complete with eight electrons, but these lone pairs, and I, uh, or bunny ears as people like to call them, really feature very prominently in biochemistry and biology because they are places for hydrogen bonding interactions. So we run a lot on electrostatic hydrogen bonding and hydrophobic interactions. If we know where the lone pair electrons are, we know one part of a hydrogen bonding interaction. It turns out that in biology, we're mostly at pH seven or in that range, except for a few subcellular compartments. But at pH eight, nitrogen lone pair of electrons will pick up a proton to become a positively charged nitrogen. And you'll mostly see that as a positively charged. So the side chain of lysine, which has an NH, uh, three, uh, an NH2 at the very end of a carbon chain is most commonly protonated and positively charged. So it could be involved in an interaction. Uh, so we can consider both the neutral and the charged, positively charged state of nitrogen. For oxygen, that oxygen lone pair will, can pick up a proton to form the hydronium ion. So that's a positively charged OH group. So it would have an extra proton using up a lone pair or, and three hydrogens, or it could give up a proton to form the hydroxide ion. And those are the states of oxygen that are most common. So in that, you've, you've, we've kind of dispatched the, those first four of the six elements. Um, phosphorus and sulfur are a little tricky, but there is some good news. Uh, Sulfur copies oxygen, so you don't really have to worry too much about sulfur. You'll just consider it to really be a, sort of an older sibling of oxygen where all the chemistry is very, very similar. Sulfur or the negatively charged sulfur anion are both important. Phosphorus is different. Phosphorus does not tend to show up in the version that copies nitrogen. It is, it is capable of adopting higher oxidation states and all of the phosphorus you meet in biochemistry, uh, for the most part, there's a few odd things in weird organisms, is going to be in the form of an oxidized form of phosphorus, which generally has one, two, three, four, five bonds to phosphorus. It can take on a higher oxidation state and you will see phosphorus. Phosphorus in the phosphate form is absolutely essential to life because it's the place where we store a ton of reactivity for the reactions of nucleotides, adenosine triphosphate, adenosine diphosphate, 
the phosphodiester backbone in nucleic acids, phosphorylation of amino acids to form phosphoproteins. It's always in this state with all the, ex the extra oxygens and that, 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 that configuration of bonds, okay? If you know this, you've got a lot of the covalent bonds under control. So any questions about this? Is everyone all right? I know it might be, it's probably a refresher for most of you. The next thing I just briefly want to mention is the most typical um, uh, functional groups that occur in biological molecules. And you may say, well, what does it mean, functional group? Usually it's a place where the action happens. If you have a large molecule that's a bunch of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen covalent bonds, there's not a lot going on unless you can really rip those bonds apart, but they're high energy. But functional groups are oftentimes where chemistry happens uh, or biochemistry happens. So there's the OH, hydroxyl. Uh, we, as chemists and biochemists, will tend to use an R where we mean something else. So we don't write out a whole structure. We would just put R, O, H, R equals, I'm going to just say anything. So, for example, if R was CH3, CH2, you would have ethanol. So, but I'm keeping it uh, more generic. The next functional group that is important is the carboxylate group or the carboxyl group looks like this. Now, when we look at these molecules, you always want to sort of think where the lone pair electrons are. There's two on oxygen, two on oxygen, two on oxygen. So that actually shows you where the rest of the electrons are. This is the carboxyl group. But in nature, in physiologic systems, this shows up most commonly in its anionic form. That's important because when we start to think of interactions between enzymes and their substrates or the folding of proteins, we're thinking of something with a negative charge, not a neutral. So this group loses a proton to form the carboxylate group. And if you want to know where the lone pairs are now, that's what they look like. So those are two of the key ones. Let's now go to nitrogen. That is the neutral amine. But as I just mentioned to you, that will very commonly pick up a proton and be in the positively charged state. Now, when I show you both of those guys in the positively charged state, what you could immediately tell me is that if I have an amino acid with one of these groups and a nearby amino acid with one of these groups, they could form an electrostatic interaction between themselves, plus and minus complementing each other. So if you know the charge states, you're much better off because you can tell where where non-covalent types of ionic or electrostatic interactions occur. So these are very important. Then there's the phosphate group. It's often ionized. And the sulpidryl group, so phosphate. The sulpidryl group is also called the thiol group. And I'm sure I've spelt that wrong because hydral, uh, they look like that. And the most common state of the subhydral, or not the most common, can also appear as the anionic structure. So that's the basic functional groups. Now, there are two more functional group assemblies that you will see a lot in physiologic systems that are basically composites of some of these structures. Because when we have single building blocks, we need to join them to each other through different types of chemistries. So I want to show you the types of chemistry that you get by forming a composite of a, hy uh, of a hydroxyl and a carboxyl group and a composite of a carboxyl group 
and an amide. Because the polymer that's the protein polymer has building blocks that have amines and carboxyls, but they're all put together into a polymeric structure where those groups have been joined in a condensation polymer. So let me just show you what those look like. And then we'll be done with the functional groups. So there are the first one, because I've drawn them in this order. Okay, is the amide, and the other one is the ester. When you do these two reactions, if you do them in the lab, they're called condensation reactions because as you form that bond, you kick out a molecule of water. These are really important new functional groups to you because your proteins are held together by amide groups. In fact, they're so important in proteins, we often call them peptide groups. You'll see more about that on Monday. And the esters are really important, for example, in derivatives of glycerol that make fatty acids or uh, phospholipids, you'll see esters occurring again and again. The other um, composite group that you can also see is with the phosphate. Plus an alcohol. And what that group looks like is as follows, and you're going to see this sort of endlessly in nucleic acids. Let's keep the charges all even here. And this is what's known as the phosphate ester. Okay, and that is yet another condensation where you kick out water. All right, so let's just run back to this image and we can sum it all up. Those are all the groups that I just described to you. And if you want, you can go back and put lone pairs of electrons on everything. And then the composite groups that I want to mention to you in particular are the amide, and the ester, and they're very important in physiologic systems. They are the bond that holds together the biopolymer in many cases. Not shown in, on, the, on this picture is the phosphate ester. I've added that this year uh, because it's kind of important. Um, is a similar condensation reaction between phosphorus and an alcohol, and uh, that in particular is what the bond you'll see that holds together nucleic acids. And now, um, one sort of thing that we won't go into a lot of detail, um, I want you to notice that this nitrogen here has a lone pair of electrons. It picks up a proton very readily. The amide nitrogen is not so willing to pick up a proton because it messes up the rest of its chemistry. So that nitrogen in an amide tends to be observed as a neutral. However, that hydrogen can be involved in hydrogen bonds. Okay. Any questions about that before we move on to non-covalent bonds? Is everything clear? Now, I try to put everything in one place so you have it in front of you. What I've put on those two slides is what you need to know about organic covalent bonding. It doesn't go beyond it. There's, I will say there's a tiny bit of memorization, but once you commit that stuff to memory, you know, you're in a good place with respect to understanding how the molecules of life are put together. Okay. Now, what is more important to me, once we've put those structures in place, is non-covalent bonding. Because to me, non-covalent bonding is synonymous with dynamics. 
forces that can be readily broken and reassembled, broken and reassembled. The energy, the strength of a typical bond between two carbons or a carbon and a hydrogen is on the order of 90 to 100 kilocalories per mole. It takes a lot to break those bonds. We can't break them at will to go and do some biological activity. But the range of energies of the non-covalent bonds are far more modest. They range from, so this is covalent, but the non-covalent range from one maybe to about 10 kilocalories per mole. So when you think about those forces, they're readily broken and made, broken and made. And what's so amazing about protein and nucleic acid structure is that you can, you can gradually break a bond while you're making another non-covalent bond. So you can have the dynamics of the structure that define a lot of its functional properties. Because structures are dynamic, uh, an enzyme that's a, a composite of a lot of non-covalent interaction, can bind a substrate, can gradually form a set of covalent bonds with that substrate, but then can start changing the shape of that structure and that shape in order to go through a catalytic cycle to do chemistry and then to liberate products. That is all driven by changes in covalent bonding, non-covalent bonding, subtle changes that occur without big energy barriers that would be necessary to break the non-covalent bo the covalent bonds. So shown at the top here, you see the average bond energy of covalent bonds. Uh, the small number is something, like, for example, between two chlorines. That's a pretty weak bond, but of course, we don't have a lot of them running around. Uh, so really, carbon hydrogen, carbon, carbon, uh, they're at the higher end, the, about 100 kilocalories, 80 kilocalories per mole. The other important interactions, though, that make up the non-covalent interactions are as follows. So the first important one is the ionic bond. It is also called a salt bridge or an electrostatic interaction. Why we give three names for this probably comes from which, which type of chemist decided to define them. They are all the same things. They are basically interactions between a positively charged entity, a protonated amine, and a negatively charged entity, a deprotonated carboxylate. Those are about the strongest of the non-covalent bonds, but it's very variable because it depends a lot on their environment. If those two entities are in a hydrophobic environment, they're gonna charge right for each other to form a strong electrostatic interaction. But if those are out in water, each of those groups could be solvated by water and they'd have to give up solvation in order to form a good electrostatic interaction. When we talk about protein folding, we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. So the reason why this says very variable is not to drive you crazy, it's just they're very variable. And they're, but they will still range, I would say, from uh, two to 10 kilocalories. Come on. So those are important, easy to pick out, the strongest of the set. If uh, Dr. Ray gives you a problem set and starts asking you to pick out non-covalent interactions, that's the one you, you take care of straight away because it is the most obvious. The next most important, though, is the hydrogen bond. Now. Hydrogen bonds have been known to mystify people for years because people are, well, how do I pick these things out? How do I pick these things out? I'm going to give you a foolproof way of picking out hydrogen bonds so you will never be at a loss for hydrogen bonds, okay? Where, how do we recognize them? They are between hydrogens that are on uh, electronegative elements such as oxygen, There's, of course, there's other things attached here, uh, or on nitrogen, or on sulfur. 
So all of those three functional groups can serve as hydrogen bond donors. They can give a proton in a hydrogen bond and share that proton between a hydrogen bond acceptor. Okay, so these are all going to be known as donors. So you can recognize them. This carbon is not a hydrogen bond donor. Carbon's got his hydrogen and is not giving it away to anybody for love or money. It's hold on tight. So this is not a hydrogen bond donor. Okay, now what are the hydrogen bond acceptors? Are places where that hydrogen would want to sit? Yes? Uh, actually, they, just re they could be double or they could be single, um, but I was just putting them so that you see that the nitrogen has one, two, three bonds to it. Okay, yeah. It could alternatively also be the form of nitrogen, just to confuse you, that has an extra proton, it could be the protonated version, because that can still be a hydrogen bond donor. Okay, now what are the hydrogen bond acceptors? They are any place where you have a lone pair. So let's just think of a carbonyl group, two lone pairs, a hydroxyl group, two lone pairs. A nitrogen that is not protonated, one lone pair. Those are the hydrogen bond acceptors. So as long as you know your structures in the, co in the, in the functional groups and you know where the lone pairs are, you can figure out where there could be a hydrogen bond. So these, all of these types are acceptors. Okay? So, in protein biochemistry, for example, those kinds of um, hydrogen bonding is very, very important to form the three-dimensional structures of proteins. And the reason why is because in a protein, proteins are made up of amide bonds where this HN can be a donor. This O can be an acceptor, and you can get networks of hydrogen bonding interactions to establish structures of proteins. When a small molecule binds to a protein, it may look to fit in a place where it can maximize electrostatic interactions and hydrogen bonding interactions. So we'll ask you to start to be able to pick out hydrogen bonding. So here you saw the electrostatic interaction. Here is a typical hydrogen bonding interaction between a hydroxyl and a carbonyl group. I couldn't spot that very readily unless I remembered that there were lone pairs of electrons there, okay? The other two, any questions about that? Any questions about hydrogen bonding? Are you comfortable with thinking you could derive your way to figuring out where they are? You'll see them used a lot, so they'll become more and more familiar to you as, as you move forward. Okay, good. The, the last two types of interactions are the hydrophobic interactions and von der Waals forces. I never get the spelling right, but I'll get the concepts over you. Now, Hydrophobic interactions are incredibly important. So when you think of folding a protein driven solely by electrostatic interactions and hydrogen bonding, you have a bit of a problem because all of those groups are hydrogen bonded to water. So you'd have to get rid of the water before they could make interactions with each other. Does that make sense? Because we're in water, we're folding in water. Hydrophobic interactions are really great because they want to form in water. If you're making you know, a batch of salad dressing, oil and vinegar, and you shake it up, what happens? It separates. The oil goes to the top, the vinegar goes to the bottom. Why? Because of hydrophobic interactions in the oil phase. So if you have a large protein that has a bunch of hydrophobic groups, they will want to collapse out of the water 
to interact with each other, and then hydrogen bonding and electrostatic will fall into place. So hydrophobic interactions are a very important and vital force in nature in the non-covalent bonding. So that's, uh, and those are literally interactions amongst molecules that have a lot of CH and CC bonds. The final force that's shown up there is the van der Waals force, uh, and we don't worry too much about that, but it is simply the interaction between very weakly polarized hydro uh, carbon, hydrogen, or other types of bonds where there's a little bit of difference between the, the a little bit of a dipole between the bond, and they form little dipolar interactions. But mostly, I think you really want to focus on the electrostatic, the hydrogen bond, and the hydrophobic. These are more minor, and it's a little bit of a subtlety. So let's focus on those three. All right. So with that said, the key thing for you, what do you need to be able to do, is understand them and recognize them in complex systems. Um, lastly, I'm just going to leave this. It's going to stay in your notes. We in, orga in uh, biochemistry tend to use line angle drawings. Um, it's kind of complicated to draw these sort of great big things with all the hydrogens and oxygens and stuff spelled out. So we use the line angle drawing. There's some shown here for different molecules. And the rules are laid out so that you can go and just figure out, do a bit of practicing, and just figure out the line angle drawing and what it means. Basically, every line represents a bond, every vertex represents a carbon atom. But what you do show on the drawings are the non-carbon um, atoms, so for example, oxygen or nitrogen. And when you show, you imply the hydrogens that are bonded to carbon, but you have to show the hydrogens that are on nitrogen or oxygen, for example, and you have to figure out what your charge state might be. So I'm gonna leave you with that. All right, okay. So what we've learned so far is these basic forces in biology are critical for the assembly of, uh, of the, the building blocks of biological macromolecules. What I want to talk to you about now, and we'll probably, uh, because I've spent a little bit, a little more to next week, but I'm gonna to talk to you about the first class of macromolecules, which are the lipids. So what makes something a lipid? These are the most sort of complicated mixture of biological molecules. They're not, formally, they're not really macromolecules, they're small molecules. But what's common to all of them is that they are very rich in carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds because all of these, the line angle drawings of all of these would suggest to you that the dominant feature of all these molecules is a bunch of CC and CH bonds, which makes the molecules quite hydrophobic. There are no functional groups there, and, uh, and they uh, behave very differently. For example, they would have a tough time dissolving in water in some cases, and so this complicated looking set of molecules can be distilled out as being very rich in carbon-hydrogen and carbon-carbon bonds, and we call those collectively lipids. Now, in, uh, they have a lot of different functions, so for example, triglycerides, such as shown here, with three ester bonds, a storage for energy. Things like estradiol, uh, uh, things like uh, steroids, um, they have this six, six, five, six, five arrangement of rings. All your steroid hormones kind of look like that, a lot of CH bonds. Uh, there are some vitamins, so for example, uh, retinol is a vitamin, it's also a lipid, and then there are the phospholipids uh, shown down here. I just briefly want to mention a little bit about retinol and retinol, which are uh, crucial. Retinol is a critical vitamin. Um, it comes actually from carotene, which is a molecule that you find in a lot of orange and yellow fruits, such as carrots. Um, but the oxidized products of retinol is this lipid called retinal, which is central to the process of vision. So retinal binds to proteins that sit in the membrane. When light shines on them, the shape of the retinal changes. It goes from a particular configuration of the double bond to a different one, the shape just changes, and that sends a signal to your brain. So lipids are important, absolutely essential in vision and sight because they're involved in the signaling process because their shapes change and send signals. 
um, other types of lipids are these things, and we call them fatty acids, mostly because they're greasy, long-chain acids uh, with a long hydrophobic tail and a hydrophilic end group here. These molecules are also what are known as amphipathic because they have a sort of split personality. They have a hydrophobic moiety and a hydrophilic moiety. Whenever you see amphi at the beginning of a word, it means both. So both hydrophilic and um, amphophilic. So these are important. And these are very important components. You probably heard a lot of press about some of the fatty acids and how bad trans fats are you, for you and how you should be careful to make sure your diet is rich in cis fats or, um, rather than trans fats because uh, the trans fats are contributors to coronary heart disease. So you may wonder what's the relationship between heart disease and these two types of them are in the body. So let me describe to you that relationship. Uh, remember the cis fats are rich in things like the, the nut oils and fruit oils such as olive oil. So coronary heart disease is associated with trans fats. What's the linkage? What's the biology in that? So in the, the, it comes, the story is related to cholesterol. Cholesterol is a critical component in our membranes. The trouble is we have to be able to move cholesterol around, but it's so hydrophobic it doesn't dissolve in water. Okay, so in the body, your cholesterol is moved around in the form of lipoproteins that bind to the cholesterol and take it to the different organs where it is needed, all right? And so the lipoproteins can either be low density and um, associate with cholesterol, or they can be high density, and those also associate with cholesterol. The high density lipoproteins are kind of large, in fact, they're fairly agile. They don't stick to arteries and vesicles, uh, vessels, and they can be excreted in the liver or move around the bloodstream without any problem. It's the low density ones that are problems because they're low density and they kind of stick to the walls of your arteries and start making buildups and then plaques which contribute to heart disease. So the low density ones have cholesterol, but they're very small, sticky, and it's a physical interaction with your blood vessels and they start to clog your arteries. What's the relationship to saturated and trans fats is that they increase the low density lipoprotein in preference to the high density. So if you have a lot of trans fats, you make a lot of low density lipoproteins. It's trying to carry cholesterol around, but it gets stuck to your blood vessels and you start to clog your blood vessels for, for heart that contributes to heart disease. So these lipophilic molecules are important. They have places to store energy. Uh, they are critical to hormones and signaling, for example, but there are some complications with disease because certain types of fatty acids contribute to heart disease. Yeah. Is it a lower density because it doesn't have the bed in it? Uh, no, uh, no, it's, it's the, the density is of the, of the entire physical particle. It's a nanoparticle that would be more float, uh, would show a different density respect to how it floats in water. So the density is really um, the physical metric of the entire particle as opposed to just the molecule. It might be different because of the way it can pack, but it, that, um, the important thing about the trans fats is that they really contribute to making the protein that forms the low density particles. Okay, all right. So um, I'm just going to introduce these, uh, not quickly, but I'll show you some cool images uh, in a, at the beginning of the next class. This is the last group of uh, lipidic molecules, and they are actually oops, esters and phosphoesters of fatty acids with glycerol. This is a small molecule that forms esters through its oxygen to these long chains and also to phosphate. And these contribute to really important um, uh, functions in the body. They are also amphipathic because they have a hydrophobic component and a hydrophilic component. And we often draw them in a shorthand form like this to represent this head group and these tails. And I want to just leave you with this wonderful image of the sorts of supramolecules that these kinds of phospholipids can form. So supramolecular, molecular.
and that's another important term, into supramolecular structures that are very, very important in living systems. Some of them uh, are just a, are useful in other sorts of engineering approaches, such as liposomes and micelles, but the most important supramolecular structure of a phospholipid is the lipid bilayer that surrounds your cells. And what happens is you simply put those molecules, the phospholipids in water, and they will their own into these supramolecular structures. Whether they form micelles or liposomes or bilayers is dependent very much on the tails of the lipids, what sorts of shapes and structures you get. But in physiology, in human physiology, the phospholipids that we have want to form these bilayer structures that have incredibly important properties, most importantly that they are semi-permeable and they can wrap, form the boundary um, to certain cells. So I will continue with the final discussion of this on Monday before we move forward to the amino acids, peptides and proteins. And I just quickly want to move you to ask you for Monday to try to uh, catch a read of the section 3.2 in the text. If you have a chance, it'll give you a nice preview. It's going to be a great lecture today. It's about proteins. I love proteins. Don't forget the handout. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to uh, briefly wrap up the lecture we were doing on Friday because there were a couple of things that I wanted to make a note of, and then we'll move on to section 2.3 about amino acids, peptides, and proteins. Now, in the last class, I introduced you to the lipidic molecules, and you can pick them out of a lineup because they are rich in carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds. As you can see here in these line angle drawings, the majority of a lot of these molecules is carbon-carbon or carbon-hydrogen. Um, they are molecules that are mostly hydrophobic, so there are some terminologies here, whoops, hydrophobic, uh, which can also be referred to as lipophilic. You either, you can hate water and love, uh, fatty acid or fatty types of materials, so those both terms are synonymous. And some of the lipids are what are known as amphipathic, and they include hydrophilic and hydrophobic components. There are a couple of tiny um, terms that I didn't mention explicitly, so I just want to go ahead and do that now. Uh, for example, in this phospholipid structure, and we'll talk about these, they have long chain fatty acids attached via esters to this glycerol unit. So there's one here and a second one here, and then what's known as the polar head group. In those fatty acids, they could be fully saturated. It means they have no double bonds in the structure. So that term saturated is equivalent to no double bonds. So no carbon-carbon double bonds or they could be unsaturated where there is a double bond within it. So that's one or more double bonds. And those double bonds take on a particular shape because there's not freedom of rotation around double bonds the same way there is around single bonds. So those single bonds, you can twist them around and twist them around, but the double bond geometry is fixed. And so double bonds, we refer to them as either trans, where the two groups are on opposite sides, leaving the double bond, or we refer to them as cis, where the two groups are on the same side. And we tend to use that cis and trans sort of naming system in a lot of other contexts as well. But you almost always want to remember that trans is as far away as possible. Cis is, cl is closer than trans. All right. So I'm just going to um, take you forward uh, to uh, the phospholipid structure. 
This is a very um, important semi-permeable membranes are made up through the non-covalent supramolecular association of phospholipid monomer units. Here's a monomer unit up here. You see it has an amphipathic structure with a lot of hydrophobicity, but also hydrophilicity. And these molecules assemble into supramolecular structures that form the boundaries of your cells. Saying they are semi-permeable tells us a little bit about what can go through them. If they were fully permeable, anything could come and go, and they wouldn't be much use, frankly. It's like leaving the door open the whole time. But because they are semi-permeable, only a few things can come and go without extra help, and other things need active mechanisms to, to go through. So let's take a look at uh, the, the boundary here. So when you see a membrane bilayer, they are, they're often shown looking like this, where every one of these units is a phospholipid, and there's water on both sides of the phospholipid because that polar head group is interacting with water on both sides. So down here could be the inside of the cell, up here could be the outside of the cell, and a lot of cells, especially eukaryotic cells, the ones that make us up, have a lot of endomembranes, membranes within the cells, for example, forming the boundary to the nucleus or to the mitochondria. Yes? Oh, this guy must be, so this looks like it's probably a saturated fatty acid. So what do you think this one might be, folks? Unsaturated, and what's the double bond geometry? Cis. So, it, yeah, it is. It's like a, it looks like a ballerina or something. Okay. So um, we have a lot of concerns, and we'll see later about how things get in and out of cells. But most commonly, uh, things like oxygen or water and other small hydrophobic molecules can pass readily in and out through the semi-permeable barrier, but other things, things that are charged, things that are big, need a different mechanism to get in and out. And we will see later on how proteins provide the opportunities to cargo things into cells or out of cells, even very large entities. And there are certain mechanisms whereby that happens through a semi-permeable membrane, OK? Um, I want to show you the other feature of membranes. They are self-healing. What this means is if you poke them, you poke a hole in a cellular membrane, you basically push apart those non-covalent forces. Once you take the thing away, be it a needle or a very fine glass capillary, they seal right back up to close, to close the hole in the cell wall. So that kind of tells us that they're non-covalent forces. So this is a really cool video of someone doing micro-injection into eukaryotic cells. The needle points to the cell, approaches the surface. You can drop something into the cell, and then the cell closes and maintain, regains its, its integrity of the barrier. So this is a very cool uh, obs uh, observation. Um, people do this. Uh, they have to not drink too much coffee because it's quite complicated to do a lot of micro-injection because you can really uh, cause carnage in your cell population if you're, if you're not very dexterous with uh, micro-injection, but people are, can be very good at it. So I just want to ask a couple of questions before, or give you a couple of things to think about before we close up uh, the lipids. So here's a typical lipid bilayer where I've highlighted a single lipid. In the colors, those are the head groups, and all in white and gray are the hydrophilic components, and just one of the uh, phospholipids is highlighted, and that would be this molecular structure here. So first of all, what do you think the non-covalent forces at that membrane interface may be? That is, what's going on here at the interface? What are the types of interactions that you might have there? give you a minute to think about it. And I want to show you that I'm actually giving you a clue here, because you can see the structure, negative charge, positive charge. But also remember, this is a barrier to water. 
So there are other things going on with the solvent that the membrane is sitting in because there's water surrounding that barrier layer. Anyone want to tell me what the answer is and why? Yeah. Did you? Are you? Yeah. Yeah. Between what and what? In the Right, so water. So that water's a good hydrogen bond donor and acceptor, so there will be hydrogen bonding. What about amongst all those lipid head groups? What's the other major force? Yeah. Between the different charges. So the correct answer here is both of them. Don't think it's just electrostatic. It's both. It's electrostatic amongst the head groups, hydrogen bonding between all that sort of dense bunch of charge and the water. And then the other question, what type of molecules can get across? I've already answered that question to you. Salts are going to need ways to get in and out. Small proteins are too big to dissolve in that membrane uh, through passive uh, mechanisms, so we're going to have to figure out how to get proteins in and out of cells. Uh, neurotransmitters such as this, this is GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid. It's charged. It just can't get through without a transporter of some kind. And it's actually proteins that end up doing the heavy lifting of the transport processes that we'll see. Okay, so moving along. This section will be about the building blocks of your protein macromolecules, which I want to remind you comprise 50% of all of the macromolecules. So that suggests it's a pretty important class of macromolecules that has a lot of different functions. Now, the amino acid building blocks look pretty simple. They're called amino acids because they have an amine. the carboxylic acid, and there's a carbon that is tetrahedral between the carboxylic acid and the amine, and the simplest of those is when those are both hydrogen, but most of the amino acids are differentiated from that, this one I've showed you on the board. This amino acid is glycine. Uh, usually, when it's just a lonely amino acid in aqueous solution, it's in a different charged form just in consistent with what we talked about in the last class. And I put it so this is glycine. It's one of the 20 encoded amino acids. That means the amino acids that are made through ribosomal biosynthesis through uh, a code that's provided by the messenger RNA. So they are encoded by messenger RNA. And later on, you'll see all of the beautiful mechanics of those processes. Now, this table looks pretty complicated, so I'm going to deconstruct it a bit. But what I first of all want to assure you is that these you will always get a handout with these structures on them. We are not asking you to remember these structures. You might become familiar with some of them, but you do not have to remember them. You'll have a table that shows them, but on that table, I won't necessarily um, give you the information on what their properties are, because those are things that you should be able to spot by looking at their chemical structures, all right? So that's important. So these are all line angle drawings. So you see the carbon, the hydrogens aren't shown in there. The charges are shown for what's called the side chain, because most of the amino acids have a side chain. Um, the amino acids are also chiral, but you'll learn more than you ever wanted to know about chirality in 512, so I won't wear you down with any of those properties. So there is a side chain that dictates the properties of the amino acids. One tiny detail, the amino acids that are encoded in our proteins are all what are known as 
alpha amino acids. There are other amino acids. GABA that I showed you on the previous slide is not an alpha amino acid. Actually, it's a gamma amino acid. These are called amino acids because the amine group is at the alpha position relative to the carboxyl. Don't need to know a lot more about that with respect to that. So let's take a look at this set of amino acids. And what you see is um, amino acid side chains with rather different properties. I've amassed, here's glycine at the very top. Um, all amino acids have a three letter code or a one letter code. I particularly enjoy using one letter codes and spelling out people's names in peptides and things like that. I'll let you do that in the privacy of your own room. It's kind of amusing to see if your name actually spells out a peptide. Uh, some, some of us, get, I get a little st stuck with Barbara because there are no B amino acid one letters with a B. The next most abundant type of amino acid have hydrophobic side chains. What that means is they have a lot of CHs and not a lot else, right? So take a look at them. Alanine has a methyl group, for example, where I've shown the R, that would be alanine. And they get increasingly big, they're quite large. Some of them have quite extended side chains. Other ones have side chains with rings with double bonds in them. Those are what we would designate in organic chemistry as aromatic. They, show sl they are still hydrophobic, but they show different properties to, the, uh, to this other set of amino acids. Some of these amino acids may actually have polar groups in them, but their major feature is that they're hydrophobic. But in an amino acid such as tyrosine, you could not only have hydrophobic interactions with that ring system, but also hydrogen bonding with the OH on the tyrosine. So some of the amino acids can do a few different things. Uh, the next set of amino acids are those that are polar and charged. And I've shown you the most common state of all of those amino acids, but you already know that the amine of lysine is likely to be charged. This guanidinium group of arginine, take my word for it, it's charged, it's a bit more complicated to draw. Histidine is also one of those that's annoying to draw, but the negatively charged side chains with a carboxylate are both negatively charged, and that's something you would remember from the previous class, hopefully. And then finally, there are amino acids with polar uncharged side chains, such as those shown here. Now, this doesn't look like a very exciting set of building blocks. How can life run on things made of 20 relatively simple building blocks with functional groups? And it's that the building blocks are not functional themselves. It is the polymers that are made up of amino acids. And I'll always call them AAs because it's easier for me. The polymers of amino acids are heteropolymers That means they're made up of a bunch of different monomer units when they're called heteropolymers. And the other important thing about these polymers is that they are of defined sequence. What is the sequence? It's the order in which the amino acids appear. So I'm writing that down, order. And all the functions of proteins are dictated by the order of the amino acids. So let's take a look at the sidebar here. So once again, remember a couple of things that we will always give you this table to think about. We'll come back. Uh, there are a couple of outliers I just want to mention quickly. So I've talked to you about glycine, the simplest amino acid with no elaborate side chain. Proline is a little odd because its side chain is kind of in a cyclic structure. And towards the end of the class, I'll talk to you about collagen, whose structure is totally dependent on the involvement of proline in the sequence of the amino acids that make up collagen. And then the last sort of unusual amino acid is cysteine. It has a thiol. And the one clever thing about cysteine, I'm just going to put a bit of a peptide here, one cysteine, and then I'm going to put a second cysteine. And these are 
going to be deemed in a peptidic structure. What cysteine can do is it can exist either with the thiol side chain, SH, or it can be at a different oxidation state where the two sulfurs are joined to each other. So, for the most part, your linear arrangement of amino acids that dictates its sequence is solely held by, together by the co covalent bonds in the peptide backbone that we'll talk about in a minute. But occasionally in folded structures, if two cysteines are close to each other and the environment is oxidizing, they will form a crosslink. But they're not what drives folding. They kind of fall into place later on. But that just sort of sets cysteine apart a little bit for its properties, all right? Okay, so coming down the side here, amino acids are assembled in a unique linear polymer of defined order. And we designate that defined sequence the primary sequence. And proteins can be a thousand amino acids, uh, 1,500, 100 amino acids. They can be various lengths. where they, you know, we would generally consider the smallest protein to be about 400 amino acids, and you might go up to thousands of amino acids. I'm gonna write 2,000 or more here. When the proteins are smaller, they are not capable of adopting too much ordered structure, and we mostly call them peptides. Peptides are sort of shorter sequences. So peptide sequences, so this would be a protein, and peptides, probably two to 39 amino acids, but these breakpoints are a little, a little bit more vague. So the primary sequence will define the structure of a protein, and we're gonna to start to talk about the hierarchical structure of proteins that's put in place. So, and that's the primary sequence. And that primary sequence is kind of a cool thing because it's very specific. It defines, it's got encoded into its structure, the three-dimensional fold of the protein, okay? All the information for the folded compact globular structure that's functional is encoded in that primary sequence. It's a cryptic code. We may, may not be able to tell by looking at it what it really looks like, but all the information is there in order to program the, co the folding into a globular structure. So the primary sequence determines the fold, and it's the fold of the protein that mandates its function. It's not the sequence of the protein. The sequence defines the fold. The fold, the three-dimensional form, defines the function, okay? So that's very important. And I think it's absolutely amazing that with a relatively limited set of building blocks, we can define so many different functions of all the proteins in our body that may be structural, they may be catalysts, they may be things that transfer information from the outside to the inside of the cell. All of that is programmed with this rather limited set of building blocks, okay? Now, uh, let's now talk about peptides because one gets a little frustrated looking at single amino acids. They don't tell us so much about the peptidic structure. So I'm going to draw two amino acids, and then I'm going to tell you one important thing. So let's put R1, and I'm going to draw another amino acid, and I'm putting it in a particular orientation, R2. because that designates that these might be different amino acids. For example, if R1 is H, there's an implied hydrogen here, that would be glycine. If R2 is a methyl group, there's an implied hydrogen there, that would be alanine, all right? When uh, nature bonds all these amino acids together, it carries out a condensation reaction to form a peptide bond between these two components of the amino acid, the amine and the carboxylic acid. And now I'm going to draw you the first of the dipeptides that you'll meet. 
and there are so many things to tell you about these structures. It, it sort of drives me crazy thinking about, oh, I must remember to tell them that, or I gotta remember to tell them that, because the structures are cool. R1, R2. Okay, so this is a dipeptide, two amino acids. And there are some characteristics I want you to remember. When we write out peptides, we always write them N to C. So in that peptide, this would be the carboxyl terminus. And this would be the amino terminus. If you don't always remember to write things in this order and you tell your friend, oh, go and get this peptide made and you put it down in the wrong order, they'll make the wrong peptide. So you always, there's basically uh, an agreement amongst everyone that we always write from left to right the sequence of peptides. The next important thing about this structure, as you look at it, there are several bonds joining the polymeric structure. Many of these bonds show free rotation. You can twist them around. There's nothing stopping that conversion. All of these show freedom of rotation. But the amide or peptide bond is unique in that there's restricted rotation about that bond. So it's as if you've got a linear polymer, but every third bond has kind of stuck in a particular orientation, which starts to define a lot of details about protein tertiary structure. It's not complete sp spaghetti. It's like spaghetti with little bits that haven't been cooked. They're stiffer than the rest of the sequence. And the other really important thing about the peptide structure is that embedded within that structure, there is the amide or peptide functional group where, remember, this can be a hydrogen bond acceptor, and this can be a hydrogen bond donor. Once you know that, the next few slides will make a lot of sense as we talk about higher order structure of proteins. So let's just take a look at that with a slightly longer peptide. Uh, by convention, if I'm going to draw a peptide that's methionine, isoleucine, threonine, you can look up that names on, those names on the chart. That would be the MIT peptide. These are the three amino acids. I'm going to condense them into a tripeptide. When I condense three amino acids, I spit out two molecules of water, and I put in place two amide or peptide bonds. If I go down this backbone, every third bond is going to be fixed, fairly fixed. There's not freedom of rotation around it. And every third bond uh, is going to have the capacity to be involved in hydrogen bonding interactions, as I've suggested here, all right? Uh, what else is there here? Um, when, when I write the MIT peptide, I write M first, I second, T third. If I wrote TIM, it would be a completely different chemical structure with different chemical properties. So the directionality is important to understand. And there you have it. <laughs> so now you can go home and practice your name in amino acids and draw them out. If you draw them out fairly um, uh, sort of sharply, then you'll never get confused about what ends what and what, where the substituents are. But it's important to remember as you're making a dipeptide, oops, I forget this doesn't work, as you're condensing a dipeptide, when you're putting these R groups on, one goes up, one goes down. But these are nuances of the structure that may, may be lit for good for a later discussion. So here is now a longer linear peptide and the suggestion of a globular structure that might be found if that peptide was folded up. So, um, and the, uh, the, the primary sequence here defines the globular structure and the process whereby you go from the extended primary sequence to the folded structure is called protein folding. And uh, physical chemists and physicists and computational chemists have for years tried to understand how we could predict the folded structure 
from the primary sequence. It's not uh, simple because what you're doing is you're solving a massive energy diagram where as you fold a structure up, you're trying to maximize all those non-covalent forces for, maxim for uh, maximum thermodynamic stability, right? It's kind of a three-dimensional puzzle where you're trying to have as many hydrogen bonds, electrostatic interactions, and so on, as you can possibly make. So when computational chemists try to fold proteins, they're basically solving a three-dimensional puzzle where they are maximizing interactions. And there are a lot of ab initio and molecular dynamics programs programs that are now starting to be able to fold proteins into fairly reliable structures, but they don't always get them right because they, 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 um, they haven't gotten all the clues yet. And also, while they may be able to do ab initio or computational folding with small structures, the headache gets way bigger the larger the structures get. So the, the predictors aren't very good at predicting big structures. They're getting better at predicting small structures. And so uh, uh, just to reinforce to you, the primary sequence is established by covalent bonds, the peptide bonds, but the globular tertiary structure is based on non-covalent covalent interactions, okay? Now, I want to ask you this. I love cartoons with science in them, but, you know, 10, 20% of the time they, get, they make mistakes. Uh, and I thought this one was particularly pertinent. It's a bunch of guys lugging around in a lab and says, well, we finished the genome map. Now we just have to figure out how to fold it. What is wrong with that cartoon? What fold? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the genome doesn't fold. It's double helical duplex DNA or something. You're actually folding proteins, so the cartoon is not quite right, but it's, it's sort of kind of cute. All right. Now, when we talk about the non-covalent forces that hold proteins together, I just want you to remember from last time this set of non-covalent forces, because if you understand them and recognize them, you'll understand how they may occur in folded protein structures. All right, so here's a, a peptide sequence. Um, here's a puzzle for you. You can go back and figure out what the one-letter code spells there. Just take out your, um, your table with all the amino acids. It's appended to the back of your P-set, and you'll be able to see what that very large peptide spells. All right. I don't want you working it out while you're here. You've got to listen to me for the time being. Okay, so the first order... We get it, there's a primary sequence. The next thing to think about is what's known as secondary structure. It's higher order than just the primary sequence and it's established by non-covalent bonds. And it's called secondary, oof, my writing's horrid today, secondary structure. And those are interactions that are put in place exclusively by interactions between the peptide bonds of what's known as the peptide backbone. So if we look at this structure, these are the side chains. The peptide backbone is this continuous linear sequence. That's what we would call the peptide backbone. And the secondary structure is put in place by hydrogen bonding between components of the peptide backbone. So for example, a hydrogen bond such as that, or a different hydrogen bonding interaction such as that between the atoms that have lone pairs of electrons, and the other atoms, he um, heavy atoms that hold a hydrogen that's quite acidic. And there are a couple of major forms of secondary structure. What I'm showing you here is what's known as the alpha helix. Uh, first, deduced by Pauling, in fact, through model building, he said proteins could form these ordered structures. And an alpha helix is an ordered structure exclusively made up from the hydrogen bonding interactions of the peptide backbone. And you can look at this helical structure. It's a continuous strand of peptide, but there are hydrogen bonds 
between uh, COs and NHs all the way through the backbone, such that this strand of polypeptide can fold up into a cylindrical, helical structure where all those R groups, the side chains of the amino acids, are on the perimeter of that helix. So this secondary structure is an important one uh, because it's uh, very prevalent in a lot of proteins. The next secondary structure is also held together by hydrogen bonding, and it's interactions between stretched out strands of polypeptides that may not be close to each other in the primary sequence, but they align in the, in the folded structure. And so, for example, what I've shown you here is what's known as uh, this, uh, this guy is N to C. This is an anti-parallel beta sheet, and across that sheet, there are continuous opportunities for hydrogen bonding interaction. If the strands run in opposite directions, it's anti-parallel. If they're in the same direction, it's parallel. These two secondary structure elements make up a lot of uh, the sort of basics of how proteins start to fold. They're key non-covalent forces. And there are also other smaller motifs. One is called a beta turn where the, the, the peptide sequence may go through a chain reversal, so the sequence would look like this. I'm going to just draw it, and I'll talk to you in a moment about ribbon diagrams. And this piece here would be the turn, whereas that would be the interactions enforced by the sheet. These are the ordered elements of secondary structure. You don't have to be able to figure them out, but you have to be able to pick them out in order to understand the structure, okay? Uh, so even those simple elements, still it's hard to make big enough structures to have functions. So as I mentioned, in a continuation of the theme that protein folding is hierarchical, you can start to put together elements of secondary structure to make things that are a little larger, helix, turn helix, helix with a different kind of turn, maybe put in place by a metal ion or something, or a strand turn strand, or now something that's a composite of these two major types of se secondary structure, the helix and the turn. And these really start to be proteins that might be big enough to be able to do something. But they're all exclusively held together by non-covalent forces between the amides or peptide bonds in the backbone of the protein, okay? Not very exciting just yet. Now, uh, one other little clue that people will, you might see and you might be confused. People sometimes when they're drawing sort of a quick picture of a protein, they might draw a helix, but instead of really showing it in detail, they might show it as a cylinder. So you might need to pick that out of a structure. Um, and then uh, I want to call your attention to the fact that in all those motifs, when you join one helix to another, you might need a turn a strand to another strand you need to turn, and so on, okay? So this is like taking your very extended sort of polymer, knowing there are different kinks in it because of the backbone bonds, but folding it up in a structure that maximizes the opportunity for another order of structure, which we'll talk about now. All right. So we've seen primary, secondary is just with backbone, and things start to get much more interesting when we get to tertiary structure, because tertiary structure is enabled by all these other interactions, electrostatic, hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic forces, that can be put in place due to the side chains of the amino acids interacting with each other or with the backbone structure. So I'm going to walk you through this so you can sort of get a sense of how these three-dimensional puzzles work on a very small scale. So look here, that's a, a very small motif. And what I'm going to call your attention to is when you fold up these motifs, when the secondary structure is in place, a lot of the side chains are near each other and they can engage in long distance contacts. And so, for example, I'm going to show you uh, interactions between side chains, between side chains and the peptide backbone, or side chains and water. But what I want you to do is take a look at this and see, can you, can you put any of those potential interactions on the drawing that's on your handout? 
um, it's pretty obvious where there's a, um, an electrostatic interaction, right? Okay, between plus, get those out of the way, those are the easy ones. And then um, interactions between hydrophobic groups where they want to amass that lipophilic structure so it's not exposed as much to water, so they cluster, so those are easy. And then you can start thinking about what are all the hydrogen bonds you could draw. Here I've shown one between side chains, between side chains and backbone, between side chains and water, and those may all contribute to the ultimate thermodynamic stability. Make sure you get your hydrogen bonds right. Remember, two donors don't interact with, a, uh, with each other and two acceptors don't. So this might describe the folding um, possibilities of that small motif. Now, what I want to show you, i going to... Is an ab initio simulation of a folding process. So let me just get that a little bigger on the screen. So this is computing. GB1 is a very small protein that folds uh, reversibly under appropriate conditions. And what I'm going to do is forward you through this video. Um, this is a simulation, this is all computation. It's not looking at anything by spectroscopy or in solution or anything like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to forward you through the structure. This is multi-scale modeling. Um, it's, got, um, it's got a lot of details in how it's done. But the starting point is a very denatured protein, all stretched out, right? And what I'm going to do is just show you for a few seconds, you know, this thing's like trying to find its thermodynamic minimum, and it's actually failing pretty badly. And it, it does that for about 30, um, 60 seconds of the simulation. So I made a point to myself to take you to about minute one where things start to get fairly interesting. You're saying, well, what's interesting about that? You see that nascent helix. In the background, the red and the blue is starting to form strands that are a little bit aligned, and it's trying to find as many connections as possible to satisfy a stable structure. At a certain point in the simulation, Five of the hydrophobic groups are in a little team. They're in a little hydrophobic cluster. And that's a break point in the folding process because that gets everything glued together better so that the rest of it now can start to really find its final place in the folded structure. These early structures are known as molten globules. A lot of the interactions are not yet in place, but the hydrophobic cluster is critical. But then after that, it's almost as if you're sliding downhill to get all the remaining interactions in place to fold the protein, okay? So protein folding is a puzzle that can be solved computationally by maximizing thermodynamic interactions. So it's sigma this, some of this, some of this, some of that. That's going to get difficult the larger the protein gets, but for small proteins, those simulations really start to make sense, okay? All right, so let's just move on here. Lost. Ah, good. What did you think of the simulation? It's kind of cool, right? So you can find the link in the sidebar, so just pop these back on now. And that's the folded structure. All right, so with many proteins, they're much more complex than that. So for example, here's cyclin A, it's involved in cell cycle, and you can see its alpha helical structure dominantly, uh, very clearly, all those beautiful alpha helices. Next to it is the green fluorescent protein, which is a cylindrical structure made up of anti-parallel beta sheets. What's really cool is when you sort of rotate it, you can see all those sheets, but then it does this little sort of uh, curtsy to the audience and you can look down into the barrel. And then in some cases, proteins may be a mixture of secondary structure elements. Here it's a little hard to tell. This is triosphosphate isomerase. But if you look down it, you can see the helices. And there's also a group of uh, uh, beta strands that are held together. So in that protein, it's a mixture of alpha helix and beta sheet. Now, 
I'm not going to tell you much about pulling up protein uh, data bank files right now because I want to cover the next topic. And then when we have a few minutes later on, I'll show you. But wherever I show you a structure, I'm trying to show you the protein data bank code. And in the website, you can see there is a free download of PyMol, which is the program I used to create all these structures and movies so you can really look at things. And uh, believe me, it took me about three years to learn how to use it. It probably take you about a week or maybe a couple of days. So if I can learn it, you can certainly learn it. Now, there is one final element of protein structure that people get kind of hung up on, and it's what's called quaternary structure. It's like, aren't we done yet? So in addition to all of these, Let's say I have a folded motif, and there's its structure. That would be have primary, secondary between the strands or the helix, and tertiary structure, right? But in some cases, proteins fold up to quaternary structure, where it's multiple of these units joined together. I could have picked a simpler fold, <laughs> but that'll get you the general gist of it. All right, where these are actually associated by non-covalent forces. So there's more than one polypeptide chain. In fact, here would be four polypeptide chains coming together in a higher order structure that's made up of four of those units. The prototypic example of this is the protein that carries oxygen around in your blood, which is hemoglobin, and it has four primary sequences that have come together in a tetrameric quaternary structure. Hemoglobin is kind of interesting because it's made up of two alpha and two beta subunits. If all these subunits were identical, they would be called homo oligomers, all the same pieces. If they are different, they are called hetero oligomers. And we'll see a little bit more about this when I talk about hemoglobin in the next class, because the, the features of the quaternary structure are very, very important for the proper transport of oxygen, and single mutations can really mess things up, and you'll, you'll see more about that in the, in the next class. Um, so just to wrap that little bit up, proteins are condensation polymers of amino acids. Each protein sequence is defined by covalent bonding. Native proteins, most of them that are not don't have quaternary structure, are folded through secondary and tertiary interactions, these things that we already talked about. And folding's defined by how to maximize all those non-covalent forces to get the maximum thermodynamic stability with the maximum number of interactions. And subunits may also come together through quaternary structure. Good. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about several proteins um, throughout the course, but for now I want to focus you in on a structural protein that provides mechanical support for tissues. In the next class, we'll talk about transporters and enzymes, and as we move on to signaling, things like receptors and membrane proteins and so on. So the protein I'm going to describe to you is collagen. It is the most abundant protein in the human body. It plays enormous roles. It's not an enzyme. It's not a catalyst. It's not a transporter. It is one of those structural proteins where the structure of collagen has evolved to provide a mechanical stability to lots of essential components of complex organisms. And there are many different types of collagens that are found in different uh, parts of the body, for example, bone, tendon, cartilage, and so on. They are all collagen structures, but they have subtle differences. Maybe some have different, slightly different mechanical properties to adapt to the functions that they perform, okay? Um, a single, and what I'm gonna show you is that a single amino acid change in the primary sequence of collagen can destabilize the structure so it is no longer viable. And the disease type I'm going to talk to you about is a, disease, a set of diseases known as 
collagen opathies, um, and the particular one is called osteogenesis imperfecta. Osteo always refers to bone because collagen plays a critical role in the structure of bone. Bone isn't just bone, it's collagen um, uh, involved in it. And it's also this disease is called brittle bone syndrome. And here's the x-ray of a baby born with brittle bone syndrome, and you'll see that the long bones in the upper arm are all uh, irregular because the bones are brittle and they'll, they'll uh, break even in utero. Uh, a lot of babies with this defect can't even be born through the birth canal because it would crush the bones. And many of them don't survive very long at all. Some survive with different kinds of cases, but their lives are greatly impacted and they could just sort of hit a table and the bones would break, all right? Uh, there are other sort of serious situations where parents are actually accused of abuse to the child, but the child actually had brittle bone syndrome, and it was just through, you know, helping them put their clothes on or taking them upstairs, the bones got broken very readily. So osteogenesis imperfecta really describes a collection of these defects. Now, the collagen uh, tertiary structure um, is shown here. It's actually made up of a type of helix. It's not an alpha helix. It's a polyproline helix where the individual subunits in, that in the structure are fairly long and extended. And I show you three strands in this polymeric structure, a yellow, a red, and a green. And these roll together into a three helix bundle that has a fibrillar structure. And then all these structures come together to make the macromolecular structure that is collagen. It's not just one of those fibrils, it's bundles of those fibrils in a very organized uh, pattern where you could even see that patterning in, uh, in electron microscopy. And there are many genetic defects of collagen. And what's so important to think about is if you have a defect in one strand, that defect will propagate through every single strand. If this is one strand made up of three uh, polypeptide chains, it propagates all the way through the structure. And I believe I have a uh, little time to just show you. Here's the collagen structure. Um, I'm just showing you how it's extended. Those are three independent strands. And there's a set of magenta residues in the middle, which come from a defect in the sequence where a glycine has been changed to an alanine. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to show you this movie because it shows you right at the center of the structure. There are residues painted in pink. And what I'm going to do is show you close up of that segment. If you look at those helices, they're all nicely organized except where that defect is. And that defect is caused by the change of a hydrogen to a methyl group on three residues that come together. And that bulges out that fibrillar structure and makes it not as compact and beautiful as it should be in the version that's got the glycine there. So if you look at it, you can even see that helix gets bulged out and is not as um, well aligned as the rest of the structure. And then that defect gets propagated into all the fibrils and results in the weakening of the bones. Either the collagen fails to form properly or the collagen, when it forms, it has much less mechanical stability. So I think that's a good place to stop. And I'll pick up next time with uh, hemoglobin. Oh, one last little thing, a couple of things for you to do. Uh, there's a great link on the website to the protein data bank to see how enzymes work. And if you have a little time, it would be awesome if you could um, just take a quick flick through those parts of the text. These slides are posted with these reading assignments, and they're posted in color if you want to look at them again.
So what are we going to do today? So today, um, we're going to continue with amino acids, peptides, and proteins. And I'm going to talk about a different protein um, uh, variant uh, that is the causative, the cause of sickle cell anemia, and it's a very interesting structural issue. But let me very briefly recap what we did last time, and then talk to you a little bit about a process known as denaturation. So last time we discussed how uh, the primary sequence of a polypeptide chain defines its folded structure. The folded structure is put in place with secondary and tertiary uh, interactions, non-covalent interactions, secondary just between amongst backbone amides, tertiary sort of everything else, even including backbone amides, but either with water or a side chain and so on. And then there are some proteins that associate into quaternary structure So these monomer subunits, as they would be called, and I'm going to depict this as like a closed circle or an open circle, may form dimers of some kind. The dimers may be heterodimers, or they may be homodimers, or you could form trimers, tetramers, and so on. And when we talk about hemoglobin, uh, which is the protein that gets, uh, that uh, has a problem is the cause of sickle cell anemia, it will, you'll see that that is a heterotetrameric protein. So in this sort of rendition, you'd kind of draw it like this, where there are four subunits, two are of one flavor and two are of the other. And that's the quaternary structure of hemoglobin. Now, proteins fold. They are weak forces that are holding them together, but there's a lot of weak forces. But if you subject a protein to various uh, treatments that may break up those weak forces, the protein will undergo a process of denaturation. So can anyone think of what kinds of things would cause protein denaturation? Yes. Heat is a bad one, is a serious one, obviously. And heat, uh, yes, I'll write them all down. What's your? pH. So H, acidity, basicity. And we'll talk about why those things cause changes. Uh, any other thoughts? Yes? Oh, yeah. So for example, um, salt, organic solvents. And a, a process that a lot of people don't necessarily think about, but as engineers, some of you will, is shear forces. So if you're shooting a protein through a very narrow uh, uh, um, tubing and there's high shear forces, those will also denature proteins. So with heat, it's very clear. You're going to break those weak bonds and then they, uh, you know, they can either reform, or if you go to too high heat, the unfolded protein starts to form aggregates. And anyone who has ever scrambled an egg knows that that is an irreversible process. You don't get to cram the egg back into the shell. It's not the same anymore, because what you're doing when you're scrambling eggs is denaturing proteins through heat treatment. So that's what heat does. It breaks the forces. The, the proteins stretch out into their denatured state, and instead of refolding to a compact structure, they just start aggregating with each other, and that's pretty much irreversible. pH is interesting. Why would pH break up at, at low temperature? Why would pH cause changes? Yeah? Well, some of the amino acids have a certain structure for their being protonated or deprotonated, and that's the pH that they're Okay, so pH, perfect. So pH will change the charge state of many of your side chains. And once you've changed it, you might have had a lovely electrostatic interaction, but then you go and protonate the carboxylic acid. And it can't, for, in fact, it wants to form a, uh, it wants to break apart as it's supposed to come together. So that is changing charge state, which causes denaturation. Salts and organics, um, for example, they make interactions with parts of the protein. For example, organics, uh, organic molecules may slip into a hydrophobic core, 
and break them up, just push them apart. They want to be there. And then too, many, too much of a high concentration of an organic solvent that is miscible with water. And we would say ethanol, acetonitrile, DMSO, but you don't need to worry about too much of which details. Will actually, once you get above 10% or so, will just start denaturing proteins, sometimes reversibly, but often irreversibly. So this is very important to know that proteins are stable, but you've got to treat them nicely. There are some human diseases that are a result of misfolded or aggregated proteins. So for example, all the prion diseases are proteins gone bad, pretty much, where they're not in a folded structure anymore, but they are in aggregates that cause problems with cellular processes and, and toxicity. So um, Alzheimer's disease, a mad cow disease, a a lot of those are uh, neurologic disorders caused by poorly folded or very misfolded proteins, for example. So uh, these are the things we talked about last time uh, with respect to the flux from primary to secondary to tertiary to quaternary. And that's a perfect time for me to introduce to you what we'll talk about today. So last time we talked about structural proteins and I showed you how collagen, uh, just with a simple defect, changing a glycine to an alanine in one of its subunits really alters the tertiary, the quaternary structure of the protein to make very weak collagen that's no longer supportive of bone strength. But what I'm going to talk to you about today is a defect in a transport protein that carries oxygen around the body. So we're going to talk about hemoglobin. Uh, these diseases are what are known as inborn errors of metabolism, or that's kind of a complex term, or genetically linked diseases, because there is a single defect in a DNA strand that then gets trans, uh, transcribed into an RNA strand, so one base defect that then becomes an amino acid defect in your protein strand. So these are tiny changes in the protein that cause dramatic changes in the structure and function of the protein. And what you will see with hemoglobin is it causes um, a real problem with the quaternary structure and, the, and causes proteins to aggregate. So hemoglobin, is the dominant protein in red blood cells. or erythrocytes, and in fact, uh, the uh, differentiation of the red blood cell as it comes from progenitor cells goes through a process where the red blood cell dumps out its nucleus, so it can't divide anymore. And basically, the content of the cell is extremely high in hemoglobin. You've packed the hemoglobin into the red blood cell at the cost of losing the nucleus. So that's terminally differentiated. Can't become a red blood cell, it can't divide anymore. And it has about a half-life, they have about a half-life of 100 days. So they turn over and then that's it. And when red blood cells turn over, the hemoglobin has to be taken care of in order that is not toxic. Red blood cells are red because of a particular molecule that's in the hemoglobin called a heme molecule, which is bound to iron, which provides the hemoglobin with the capacity to pick up oxygen in your lungs travel it around the body and then leave it where it's needed and then replace the oxygen with CO2 and take the CO2 back to the lungs in order for you to respire it out, okay? So hemoglo the hemoglobin carries oops, oxygen and CO2 from oxygen from the lungs, CO2 back to the lungs. And the reason why you need the iron is that the iron 
is coordinated to the oxygen. So the heme molecule, I won't draw it if you want to see it. It's a big, complex organic structure, very interesting structure, but something for another day here. The, but I want to just stress to you that the iron heme complex is red. That's why your blood cells are red. Your blood cells don't have a nucleus, so they can cram in lots more hemoglobin. So it's kind of a fascinating situation. So hemoglobin is an example of a homotetrameric protein, and it has four subunits, two of one flavor and two of another. So we call this an alpha-2, beta-2 protein, differentiating the alpha subunits and the beta ones. Yes? Why isn't Why isn't it homotetrameric? It's, uh, <laughs> you could ask, why is it? I don't know. I mean, there will be interactions amongst the subunits that favor that particular packaging. The subunits are kind of similar in shape. They have what's called a globin fold. You can more or less pick out those tubes, remember, are alpha helices. Um, they could form tetramers that are all the same, but the energetically favored form is the two and two. Hemoglobin is a tetrameric protein because that's really advantageous for picking up oxygen and dropping off oxygen in a very narrow oxygen range. So there are proteins called globins that just one of these that can bind oxygen. Hemoglobin is tetrameric because it has a cooperative oxygen binding. So in a very narrow range of oxygen, it fills all four sites in the tetrameric protein with an oxygen molecule. So it's very advantageous in, from a physics perspective that it responds to very narrow changes in oxygen. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Okay, it means co anything that's cooperative means that one, let's say I've got a tetramer of hemoglobin, one oxygen binds to one of them. So I'm binding oxygen here. And then binding to the next, the next and the next gets easier and easier. So it's, they, they, they sort of want to come in as a team. And that's handy for maximizing oxygen transport around the body in a narrow oxygen range, which we can only deal with what's out there in the atmosphere. So we have to make this work. Does that, does that answer your question? OK. All right. So where was I? OK. So, so what we're going to do today, we're going to look at hemoglobin. It's the tetrama, those discoid structures are the hemes that I just mentioned. I've drawn them as this sort of four-leafed clover here, just for simplicity. And there is a single defect in the sequence of the single monomer subunits in hemoglobin. Uh, so each of these, let's go over here. So there are four proteins, beta globin, two copies of beta globin, and two copies of alpha globin. They are all, let me see, what's the size? Do, 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 two pretty subs. You know, I can never see things when I'm up at the screen, but they're about 150. <laughs> 156. <laughs> okay, so they're about. 146 amino acids long in each of them. And a single defect in a beta globin where you have a change from glutamic acid residue 6 to valine at residue 6, one change in uh, beta globin, which means two changes in the whole structure because there are two beta globins, alters the properties of the hemoglobin and causes what's called sickling of your red blood cells. So let's take a look at what that would look like at the amino acid level. Glutamic acid is one of your charged amino acids. I'm just going to draw a little bit of it as it were in a peptide. And it's at position six in the sequence, so it's six residues from the amino terminus, because we always write things in this direction. And the change takes place to put in place a valine. And 
there's a pretty big change in the identity and personality of those residues. You've gone from polar charged to neutral, big, fluffy, hydrophobic residue. And it's really amazing. So the beta globin is expressed on chromosome 11. It's 134 million base pairs. One base is changed. So um, what you have in the DNA, in the normal DNA that encodes the normal beta globin gene, uh, there's a, a particular sequence of nucleic acids. This is what the double strand would look like. We're going to see way more about nucleic acids next week. When that gets converted to the messenger RNA, you get a particular code that in the genetic code codes for glutamic acid. Everything's normal. A single change, if we change the center nucleic acid within the DNA, it makes a different messenger RNA and one base pair puts in valine instead of glutamic acid out of 134 million base pairs. So what happens in the normal, uh, normal hemoglobin you have normal behavior, you have this tetrameric structure, folds, co um, it's cooperative, it carries oxygen, it moves around the blood, no problem. Excuse me, it sits in the erythrocytes or red blood cells, no problem. The minute you have that mutation, the hemoglobin molecules start to associate into clusters, like fibrillar clusters, because each tetramer gets glued to another tetramer and another one and another one. So you have hemoglobin not behaving as this beautiful independent quaternary structure, but rather sticking to um, physically sticking to other molecules. And those tangles get, uh, those molecules get so, so um, large that they start to form long and inflexible chains. And it's such a dramatic change that that discoid structure you're, that you're familiar with for red blood cells suddenly becomes a sickle shape. So that would be the normal cell with normal hemoglobin, but sickle cell, uh, they look like this. They're kind of curved. Odd, a very odd shape. And the problem is red blood cells have evolved to move really smoothly through your capillaries. As soon as you get a different shape that's sort of, um, uh, you know, not that uh, discoid structure, they start uh, clogging in the capillaries. And when you have the defect where all of your hem hemoglobin is messed up with this variation, it's incredibly painful because think of all your capillaries going out to the farther reaches of your joints, the very thin blood vessels are, are, are blocked up with the sickled red blood cells that are caused by the variation in hemoglobin. So that one little defect takes us all the way to a serious disease, all right? So what I want to do very briefly is show you the molecular basis for this. All right. Um, and the defect actually appears on the two beta globin chains, but right on the outside of the protein, not in the middle of the protein, because this is a defect that affects how proteins interact with other proteins, not the function of the protein on its own. Probably still carries oxygen just fine, but it's the mechanical change in the hemoglobin that causes the disease. Okay, so uh, sickle cell anemia, uh, the hemoglobin is now called hemoglobin S with that mutation that I just described. Um, and when people ha are heterozygous, it means they have one good copy of the gene that's normal and a copy of the gene that's the variant. And you'll learn much more about this in human genetics when we talk about that later on. So you have a mixture of the okay hemoglobin and the bad uh, and the sickle cell hemoglobin people who are homozygous for the defect all of their hemoglobin is um, is disrupted and those are the people who really end up in hospital with a lot of transfusions and so on the heterozygous actually you can manage quite well with and i'm going to show you in a minute that in some parts of the world, being heterozygous, i.e. having some of your hemoglobin with the defect and some without it, actually confers an advantage. It's a really cool story, okay? So, uh, what I wanna do is quickly show you uh, the wire structure. Okay, so this is the structure 
that elucidated the real reason for, the, for the, the interaction, what happens when you have this mutation, okay? And it was a structure that was captured of a dimer of hemoglobin molecules where you could really see what was happening at the interface and the sorts of changes that had been put in place by that variation from the charged to the neutral structure. So for any of you who want to pop by, I can start to show you how to manipulate uh, pi mol. We can do that separately from class. But this is a dimer of tetramers. Um, and um, if I just show you just um, some of the subunits, I can actually show you how there's two of each subunit in each structure. So if I go, I can pick some out, every other one, G, and then I can color them a different color. You can see where the globins, where the beta globins are and where the alpha globins are. That still looks like chicken wire. It's very unsatisfactory. So what I can do is I can show you everything as a cartoon and get rid of all those little uh, lines. And then you can see perfectly the two, the structure where you see two beta globins and two alpha globins in each structure. Okay, so what we're going to do next is zoom in to see what's happening, where we've done this mutation, what's going on with the placement of the baleen in that structure, all right? Okay, and wherever I put a four-letter four code, so that one was 2HBS, that's what's known as the protein data bank code, and it enables you to go fetch the coordinates of that protein. So if any of you for the late project want to do a protein structure and print it, come to me and I'll explain a lot more about that, or, or the TAs can also do that. So let me now move you to looking in closely to the variation. So what I've done here is I've actually colored the beta globins purple, and the alpha globins are cyan colored. You can see the hemes in each of the subunits. Those are those red wire things. And now we've zoomed into the place where the mutation is, where you have a baleen instead of a carboxylic acid. And what you can see from this image, which should stop, is that the baleen on one subunit in one homotetramer interacts with a sticky patch on another subunit that's made up of phenylalanine 85 in the adjacent protein and leucine 88 in the adjacent protein. So this sticky patch on one surface glues on to a sticky patch on the surface of another tetramer. If you had glutam glutamate there, would that form? No. In fact, it would be quite deterred from forming because you don't want to cram that negatively charged element into those two hydrophobic residues. So what you've gone from is a situation where this really is fine on a surface, it's hydrated, it's not sticking to anything, to another situation where you have phenylalanine and uh, leucine. which are both hydrophobic, providing a patch on the one tetramer where the, the valine from the other tetramer combined. And because the molecules are tetramer on each of the subunits, there is also another valine that will go off and do that elsewhere, and another valine, and there's one you can't see that's tucked behind. So that's why the hemoglobin forms these packed structures, because every hemoglobin molecule has two places to stick to another hemoglobin tetramer and so on. So think of the repercussions from one nucleic acid change. That's really quite remarkable. So what we've seen here is that that change occurs. So just, just a couple of moments for you to think about this. You can have variations at that site that won't cause a problem. Which ones of these do you think are least likely to cause a sickle cell type of uh, uh, phenomenon? So tyrosine, serine, aspartic acid, and lysine. So I'm going to change the glutamate to something else. Which one's going to have a perfectly normal hemoglobin? There's one that stands out. Yeah, aspartic. That's fine. No problem. It just switched it for its younger brother. Which, which one of the others? And, uh, and in many cases here, you could probably argue your way to all of them. But one would be pretty bad. Which one would be pretty bad? 
tyrosine, exactly. It's another, even though it's got that OH group, it's still pretty hydrophobic because of that ring system there. Um, what about the other two, serine and lysine? What do you think? Which one would probably be, in fact, the least detrimental of those remaining two? And give me the reason as well. Yes. Lysine. I think it would be lysine because lysine is now positively charged. It's equally unlikely to want to do this goofy interaction because it is also charged, just charged in the other direction. But one could also argue that serine would be okay because it's got, it's a little bit more not, uh, not, uh, polar, so it wouldn't cause as much problem. Okay. Finally, the, this issue with sickle cell anemia, there's some fascinating data that shows in parts of the world, for example, during a drug trial for a Plasmodium falciparum, one of the causative agents of malaria, they found that one out of 15 people with the sickle cell trait was infected with malaria, whereas the, the people who were healthy, normal homozygous for the right hemoglobin, 14 out of 15 were infected with Plasmodium falciparum. Now, what do you think, why do you think that is? How can we relate the infectivity of a parasite with the shape of a cell? We've gone from these juicy looking red blood cells, nice and round and probably quite open, to a cell that's sort of difficult shape so it turns out that the parasite doesn't want to infect the sickle cells, celled, uh, red blood cells anywhere near as well. And there are, for example, other uh, bloods tested, which shows the same correlation. And here's a map of Africa where you see a massive overlap of the prevalence of the sickle cell trait and the, uh, and the presence of uh, Plasmodium falciparum. So there's, there's, there is an evolutionary advantage to having the heterozygous uh, variant where you have some normal hemoglobin, but some of the sickling hemoglobin because it confers you some resistance to, uh, to, to malaria. Um, it's not good to have both of them uh, the variant that causes sickling because that's painful and it really causes a lot of health disorders. It's just when you have one of each uh, gene encoding both variants, okay? All right, great. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about enzymes um, and these are the proteins that catalyze reactions. Any questions about that? So while a lot of disease states actually might be bred out because someone would be at a disadvantage with a particular disease, in this case, that trait has been maintained because it offers a very different advantage with respect to disease. Okay, let's talk about enzymes for a moment or for the rest of the class, in fact. Okay, so enzymes are the heavy lifters of the uh, protein world because they catalyze all the reactions in metabolism, in biosynthesis, all kinds of transformations that make you what you are. Enzymes are protein-based catalysts, you all know that. Terrible writing again. There are a couple of other terms I just quickly want to give you. So an enzyme, there's also a term known as an isozyme and an allozyme. You may see them, you'll see allozyme less commonly, but you'll see isozyme quite commonly. An isozyme of one enzyme is a variation on the enzyme that catalyzes the same reaction, but it's expressed on a different gene. An allozyme is the same enzyme, but with a variation in it. So it's, uh, it's encoded by uh, an allele of one gene. So the, uh, it's just a variation of the gene that might have happened through a mutation, still catalyzes the reaction, but there's a change in the, a slight change in the sequence. But they're coded by the same gene, same gene 
with a variation. And as I said, you will see the isozyme term more commonly than the allozyme term. Now, why do we need enzymes? Well, the problem is there are reactions, physiologic reactions, that we need to carry out that are just too hard to carry out at room temperature, pH 7 in water. They just don't occur. So you need enzyme catalysis for all of your metabolic reactions. Let me just give you one trivial example. This bond, you already know nicely now, peptide or amide bond. If I want to hydrolyze that, if I want to break it open, pH 7, physiologic temperature, so 37 C, um, you know, in water, it would take me how many years is it? The half-life of that bond would be 600 years, okay? <laughs> and that's pretty untenable for digesting a Big Mac, even, even under the best of circumstances, right? So we need enzymes to speed up breaking down proteins, carrying out reactions, because otherwise we just can't, we can't do anything. So what I want to describe to you are some of the details of how enzymes work and then how we can control the function of enzymes. So typical enzymes take a substrate to a product. Some enzymes may take two substrates and make one product. Some enzymes may take one substrate and make two products. It just depends on the transformation that you're doing. Enzymes are classified into a bunch of different families, but the thing that will tell you that something you're reading about is an enzyme is the suffix A-S-E at the end of the name of the enzyme. So the enzyme, that hydrolyzes the peptide bond or hydrolyzes proteins is called, no big surprise, a protease. And you'll see later on ribonuclease, DNAs, oxidoreductases, all kinds of re reactions where if you see this term at the end of the name, it's telling you quite loud and clear that it's an enzyme. It's just a very sort of simple way of remembering that. Now, Enzymes promote, promote reactions in order that we can have them carried out at, at room temperature. But we want to think about how they, uh, they carry out these uh, changes and transformations. What is it about the structure of the protein that enables these reactions? But the first thing we have to do is take a look at the thermodynamics and kinetics of a transformation. So before I go anywhere, what I want to do is describe to you how enzymes work by thinking about the physical parameters that we describe the energetics of a transformation. So in, uh, in thermodynamics, you will know delta G is delta H minus T delta S. And we're really only gonna worry about one of these terms. We're gonna worry about delta G and I'll explain why. So delta G, is the Gibbs free energy. H is the enthalpy. Uh, T is the temperature in Kelvin. And then uh, S is entropy. So these are the two terms when you're looking at an energy diagram, we generally think about reactions where we describe the Y coordinate as the change in delta G, the change in the free energy, and the X coordinate is your reaction coordinate. So in going from a substrate to a product, we generally have a situation where we have a substrate at a certain en uh, energy, 
and then maybe a product at a different energy. And we're going to talk about the details of that. So why do we deal with Gibbs free energy, not an enthalpy? Does anyone know? OK. Enthalpy describes the energies of all the bonds in a molecule. But when you're doing an enzyme catalyzed transformation, you're not busting open all of those bonds. You're not breaking something down to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. You're only dealing with parts of the energetics of the molecule. You're only dealing with what's known as the free energy changes. To look at the enthalpy changes isn't going to get you very far. It's not going to describe the reaction because the enthalpy changes would be enormous breaking down that molecule. And that's not what you want to achieve. In a chemical transformation, we care about delta G. Now, the next thing to, to think about is what are the energetics of the reaction and how does an enzyme catalyze reaction manipulate those en energetics? So the key thing here is we want to talk about Gibbs free energy. Now, I shouldn't have written quite this much stuff here because I need the blackboard. All right, so when you describe a reaction, you want to understand how far that reaction goes and how fast that reaction goes. So when you go through a reaction, we can describe how far the reaction goes by thinking about the free energy of the substrates and the products. So in this case, the substrate is at a higher energy than the products. So you will go a long way through the reaction to make much, quite a lot of product in a, in a transformation. So that describes how far the reaction goes. So that is the difference between the energy of the substrate and the product. How fast the reaction goes can say, is, um, is described in a di different part of this di diagram. Does anyone know what it is? Yes. Activation. Yes, exactly. How fast the reaction goes is literally how high the mountain is that you have to get over to, to carry out the transformation. And that height is described as the energy of activation. So that tells you how fast, and the difference here tells you how far. The energy of activation um, is a really important parameter because it's actually what gets manipulated when you're dealing with catalyzed reactions. So the energy of activation, the higher that mountain is, the slower the reaction will be because it's a much harder transformation to go through. The reactions in our bodies can be of different flavors depending on the difference in energy of the substrate and the product. So shown there, substrate going to product, where the product is at lower energy than the substrate, we would call this an exergonic reaction because we're releasing energy in the, in the transformation. So S higher than P, exergonic. And if we have a different reaction, and I'll sketch this one in here. Where the product is higher energy, and this is a reaction coordinate, then that will be an endergonic reaction. Both reactions happen in enzyme-catalyzed systems, and we'll explain why you're able to catalyze even ones that require energy. So exergonic releases energy. And endergonic requires. What else have I got on here? Um, we also, in the situations where energy is produced, the exergonic reactions, we call these 
catabolic processes. And if you have trouble remembering catabolic and anabolic, just join me in that because I always forget which is which. But the ones that produce energy are catabolic. The ones that require energy are anabolic. And when we think about metabolism, the catabolic reactions are when we're breaking molecules down because we need energy. We need to use it to do something. The anabolic reactions are when we want to store things, store fats, build proteins, because they're going to be endergonic. They're going to be requiring energy to take place. I just forgot one thing that I when shamefully done. Remember, this axis is kilocalories per mole most commonly uh, when we're talking about delta G or kilojoules per mole if you're in a different part of the world. But uh, it's important to have units on these diagrams. So that tells us a little bit about enzyme catalyzed reactions. We need the enzyme to do something about this energy of activation. Because if we didn't have a high energy of activation, and I brought a Snickers bar to eat during class, it would just burst into flames, right? It, has, it needs a high energy of activation to keep it stable uh, regular, in under regular conditions, but only break down the bonds under time, at times when you require that breakdown, all right? All right, so what do the catalysts do? Okay, now, I've shown you this simple reaction. The enzyme's a very large structure. It binds to a substrate, chemistry happens, and it releases a product. But at the same time, you can't disobey the principles of thermodynamics. So there are certain criteria we have to think about when we consider an enzyme-catalyzed reaction. So first of all, do not disobey whichever law of thermodynamics this is. They do not change delta G. Delta G is a property of the two reactants. You're not going to change it with a catalyst. Uh, it's, it's going to have a much more, uh, a more important impact on a different parameter. Which parameter uh, do enzymes change and help uh, lower? Over there. Right, so catalysts do oops, <laughs> to change and in fact, lower energy of activation. And we'll talk about how they do that at the end. And then the last rule about a catalyst is you can recover them unchanged after a reaction. It would be a lousy catalyst if it did its chemistry and then you've used up the catalyst. So enzyme catalysts are the ultimate green reagents. You can keep using them thousands and thousands of times to continuously turn over transformations. So the, you haven't changed the catalyst. So the things that we want to think about is how, what are the processes that, uh, that enzymes can manipulate Um, and I should probably just quickly run through these slides. So we've talked about these entities, but I put them on the board because they're particularly important. So the energy of uh, activation of a catalyzed reaction is lower than the uncatalyzed. And I'm not going to bore you with these questions because you can uh, work this out quite readily. So delta G is uh, the free energy that changes. And these are endergonic because the energy of the products is lower. So this is the slide I want to get to with respect to the enzyme, uh, to enzyme catalysts. So we always think, well, gosh, the enzyme is really large relative to the size of the product. That's because all that energy within the protein folded structure is very useful for lowering the energy of activation of a transformation. So let's say I have a reaction that involves two substrates coming together to make a product, right? If I'm off the enzyme, these guys, it's gonna take them a long time to bump into each other to do chemistry. The way enzymes catalyze those types of reactions is they have binding sites for both of those compounds. In fact, the enzyme acts as a stage, one substrate binds, the other substrate binds, they're binding close to each other on the enzyme, chemistry can happen, it favors reactions that involve multiple molecules. 
What about another situation where you have a bond, for example, the amide bond, that proteases break? It's hard to think of how that, how can we make that more easy? Well, amides are most stable when they are flat and planar through this arrangement of atoms. But what can happen on the enzyme is that they can twist bonds to make them less stable and then more easy to hydrolyze. So the structure of that enzyme basically holds onto the substrate and twists or distorts the bond that you're trying to do chemistry on to once again lower the energy of activation. Another way enzymes work is in a reaction where you're breaking this bond, you might make charged intermediates. The enzyme's there to hold those charged intermediates in order to stabilize them, once again, to lower energy of activation. So it's funny when you get the question that's, well, how do enzymes catalyze reactions? There is no one rule. You want to think about the reactions and then just think about the ways in which an enzyme could contribute to that. For example, orienting two substrates ready to do chemistry, uh, causing physical strain in a bond that you want to break, or comforting electric charges, uh, charges that form a, during a reaction coordinate. So there are loads and loads of different principles, and it's a really um, important study that's carry, that is carried out. So finally, and I think I have a couple, yeah, no, I have a couple of minutes, but I want to just describe this to you. It'll also be covered in the sections because I'm going to rush it a bit because this last bit is, uh, features a little bit on the, on the piece set. So finally, we've, enzymes are very commonly the target of drugs. We like to think that some drugs are important targets. If we deactivate the enzyme, we might mitigate the symptoms of a disease. Now, you can't go in and heat the enzyme or, you know, denature the enzyme if you're trying to treat a person. So we do a lot of work to mitigate disease by inhibiting enzymes with small molecules. So in these slides, I describe to you the types of molecules that may alter the chemistry of a transformation. So if a substrate binds to an enzyme active site, we often do this Pac-Man rendition, you could design a molecule that binds there instead and basically inhibits the substrate from getting there. This would be called a simple reversible uh, inhibitor that's competitive with the active site. There are other inhibitors that will bind to the enzyme but do chemistry with it and stay blocked at the enzyme and that would be called an irreversible competitive inhibitor. You can't get the inhibitor off. And there's differences in the way you can reverse this, because for example, up here, if I add a lot more substrate and these are equilibria, I can get my reaction to happen anyway. But here, I could add as much substrate as possible, but it won't help, it won't reverse the transformation, okay? And there's a question here to restore the reaction, the answer really is you just have to start with new enzyme because you've covalently changed the protein structure. The last type of inhibitors that are important are ones that bind at different sites on the enzymes, and they are called allosteric. Allo always means different. So if you have a compound that's an allosteric inhibitor, it might bind on another face of the enzyme, but it'll alter the active site so it doesn't work. That's an allosteric inhibitor. And the final type of compound is an allosteric activator that may bind somewhere else on the enzyme but make it more active. So these are sm the way small molecules work. Um, I'd like to encourage the TAs to just cover this in a little bit more detail because I've rushed it. And I'll also re-mention it at the beginning of the next class. But bear in mind, we should have everything covered now for the problem set one. Um, and if you have any questions, reach out to us cover them in section, and I'll reiterate a little bit of this in the next class. And finally, there's a little bit of reading. If you would like to prepare, we'll talk about carbohydrates next time, one of my favorite molecules. And there's also a fabulous set of videos on how enzymes work at the Protein Data Bank uh, site. And you will see this little handout on the slides, version of the slides that's posted.
Okay, uh, I just want to um, just highlight your attention to things. Like every day I get the MIT news feed, I get a couple of other news feeds, and I just thought this was really sort of a striking image, and I think um, a great way to convey science and engineering is through uh, sort of really eye-catching imagery. And this, uh, these are, this is a synapse, which is where nerves contact to other nerves or to the neuromuscular junction in order to trigger um, activity. And uh, this is um, a piece of research out of the uh, SEMA, whoops, go back one, whoops, go back one more, <laughs> between the SEMA and uh, Langer Labs, where they've designed a little tiny microchip probes. They're about 10 microns big that can be planted in the brain in different sites, non -in hopefully non-invasively, uh, uh, and they can report on concentrations of this neurotransmitter dopamine. And the reason you might want to be able to do that is that there is a dopamine deficit in a lot of neurologic disorders, so you would like to understand what the deficits are and pinpoint uh, points of the brain where there may be issues. And in fact, uh, they used it to track um, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease because Parkinson's disease, some of the therapeutic approaches involve deep brain stimulation, but you can't really tell if it's working unless you can measure something, and the thing that you could measure would be the absolute levels of this neurotransmitter dopamine, which, by the way, is originated from the amino acid um, tyrosine. Uh, you could sort of uh, spot some of the parts of that. That would be the carbon uh, becomes a cut. There's a carboxylate and um, uh, an amine. Oh, I've drawn <laughs> I've drawn the alcohol. This should be an NH2 group. Sorry, I just added this at last minute. So um, dopamine actually though originates from tyrosine. Uh, so I just thought you would be interested because when I talk about highlighting things that are in the news, I mean things like this where we're all kind of interesting. It's cool, it's relevant to what we do, um, and it really um, combines the efforts of scientists and engineers to make uh, tools and methods and invent methods to make measurements that are quantitative enough to guide the analysis of a, of a, of a disorder. So I just want to wrap up a little bit on the uh, uh, aspects. I was showing you the energy diagrams in the last class and uh, telling you how um, enzymes affect the course of a reaction by lowering the energy of activation by stabilizing a transition state or a high energy intermediate state. So the energy of activation becomes smaller in the catalyzed reaction, therefore faster than in the uncatalyzed reaction. And I did not give you this number last time. Enzymes um, uh, catalyze reactions through about 10 to the 6, a million to t uh, 10 to the 10 fold. So these are dramatic increases in rates that are really a physio we, we depend on physiologically. They ensure specificity and they're essential in all systems. And the, uh, the way we discuss uh, energetic changes in reaction diagrams is by looking at what's known as the delta G. It's the change in free energy. What I show you here is an exergonic reaction where it is a negative delta G. I didn't reinforce that point enough last time. The energy of the products is lower than the energy of the substrates, so energy is given out at the end of the transformation. That means the reaction is favorable with respect to an equilibrium, a thermodynamic parameter, and then it's the enzyme that takes care of the kinetic um, uh, uh, aspects of the reaction. So um, uh, just to sort of show you the correlate, an endergonic reaction would look like this, where the delta G is positive, the products are less stable than the starting materials, which would mean the reaction is not favorable, but it will still proceed in the presence of a catalyst. And in this next small bit, where we talk about pathways and different aspects of metabolism, I'm gonna tell you how we get around the unfavorable equilibrium problem, because that's obviously a big predicament in biochemistry. If reactions aren't favorable, why do they, why do they go far enough to be useful to us um, in, in metabolism? Uh, and so that reaction would have um, a positive delta G. And then I also mentioned these two terms, anabolic, 
refers to the, endogon uh, the endogonic reactions. I don't know why you're doing this to me. The endogonic reactions and catabolic refers to the exergonic reactions. Okay, uh, then this last point, I showed you this slide last time, but I think it was important to think about why are enzymes so big? And I want to give you some exa uh, one example of an additional genetic mutation that causes a human disorder, where I at least show you how the mutations are spread quite a distance from the reaction center to show you that all of that structure that you see in an enzyme as it interacts with a small substrate um, is critical for catalysis. So we see small substrates in each case, but we have this very large enzyme, which is many, many times its size, all engaged in catalysis. But what's the proof of that? So why are enzymes so big? So phenylketonuria is a human disorder. It's one of those disorders that uh, neonates, uh, brand newborns are tested for. Uh, they, they're checked for the genetic signal uh, that shows that the protein will have mutations in its structure. And there are many mutations associated with the, a defect in this particular protein. And the protein that I'm talking about is phenylalanine hydroxylase. So uh, the disorder is related to defects in phenylalanine hydroxylase. Now, what does that enzyme do? It takes phenylalanine and installs a hydroxyl group opposite to where it's attached to the amino acid. So this is the hydrophobic amino acid phenylalanine, and this is another one of the hydrophobic amino acids in a similar family that's tyrosine. And in fact, it's the precursor to dopamine physiologically. Now, it turns out there's, there can always be too much of a good thing. So if you have too much phenylalanine, it has to be converted to a different amino acid because the buildup of phenylalanine gets to a certain stage where it is converted itself to a toxic byproduct that actually causes severe uh, mental disorders and seizures. So you need to, the body needs to monitor the levels of phenylalanine and at a certain stage phenylalanine hydroxylase will convert it to tyrosine. So even though phenylalanine is essential, too much phenylalanine is a bad thing. So that enzyme is the one that is associated uh, with defects, that, uh, with mutations that lower the activity of the phenylalanine hydroxylase and end you up accumulating phenylalanine too high. And so the PAH regulates the clearance uh, from the body converting it to tyrosine. So why, you know, I, I just, I told you I would give you some um, in, insight into how entire enzymes are in fact critical for catalysis. So what I'm showing you on this little movie is that the sites shown in magenta all around this protein, the active site would be where this big ball is, it's actually a uh, cofactor iron. But the sites that are involved in the reduction of activity of phenylalanine hydroxylase are way out on the protein, out on its perimeters. So this protein is about 49 angstroms, uh, uh, 4.9 nanometers across. But the sites that cause a reduction in activity are a long way away, 10 angstroms, longer, 15 angstroms, angstrom 16. So it turns out that enzymes as catalysts don't just use the local environment right near where chemistry happens. The entire protein collaborates to make the changes happen in catalysis. So enzymes are big because you're not just using this inner shell of functional groups where the substrate binds. You're actually using a lot of the dynamics of the enzyme to pr promote catalysis. And just this uh, sort of visual uh, shows shows you how far away things can be where they suppress the activity of a protein and make it a poorer catalyst, okay? Uh, so, um, as I said, this is one of the dis uh, disorders that uh, the genetic mutations that test it is tested for at birth. If you have one of these set of mutations, you immediately have to be put on a diet that, that's um, low in phenylalanine, so you don't bombard your body with too much phenylalanine, allowing uh, the cis uh, not allowing the phenylalanine to build up too much. But there, you, I don't know if any of you have lately grabbed a can of Coca-Cola that's got um, aspartame as a sweetener. It turns out that sweetener, NutraSweet rather, is a dipeptide, see, 
but it contains phenylalanine. So if you drink a ton of diet drinks that include NutraSweet, you are actually bombing yourself with high levels of phenylalanine that the body can't deal with. So people who have phenylketonuria, i.e. a defect in that enzyme, shouldn't be drinking um, or using NutraSweet type sweeteners because they actually give you too much phenylalanine at once that you can't mitigate the levels of. So I want to just tell you about these uh, genetic disorders. There's a, a, a fairly decent set that are tested for at birth, but the ones that are tested are for ones that you can make dietary modifications or lifestyle modifications and mitigate the, the symptoms. Uh, and so that's um, a, a very important thing to know. You're not tested for things you don't know how to fix uh, because that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be appropriate. All right. Any questions about that? Yeah. Oh, you know, that was me being clunky with, <laughs> gosh, you guys notice everything. Uh, <laughs> this morning I was making, all right, let's go forward. One, two, and that, and that. I know, what, I know exactly what you're talking about. This little curve down. Yeah, that's, that's me shaking when I'm doing the chem draw or drawing. It should be a flat, <laughs> but thank you for noticing that. Uh, just so that's not in ambiguity, there should not be. There could be actually a little dip when substrates bind to enzymes, but I didn't mean to imply it. Okay, anything else? Okay, so what I want to talk about now is the equilibrium problem. And what is that? So if we have reactions that are endergonic, so we have one of these situations where we have a substrate going to a product that's higher energy. What that means is at equilibrium between substrate and product, which is defined by the delta G, you have substrate going to product, but mostly you've got a lot of substrate there, which is the amount of each of these is defined by this energy difference, okay? So how do we survive with these kinds of transformations when we really want the flux through an enzyme to be in the forwards direction? Because if we need the product, we need to move things forward. So nature deals with this by coupling reactions to other reactions. So it finds ways around the equilibrium problem by, for example, putting a series of reactions. For example, let's go from A to B to C. So these are three intermediates catalyzed by enzyme one, enzyme two. Okay, and let's just say this has an unfavorable delta G. So we don't make, we have a lot of A. We have very little B. And then what happens? How are we going to, and then let's just say, for example, this reaction is favorable. All right, so let's say the delta G here is positive. The delta G here is negative. All right, so by plus VE, I mean positive and negative. So this is a favorable reaction, whereas this is an unfavorable reaction. How does putting two reactions adjacent to each other happening on the same substrate and moving through help that situation? Yeah. Perfect. So the answer here is that as you take whatever B you have and turn it into C, A has, um, A has to, E1 has to make more B. So you solve the equilibrium problem in that way to a certain extent by just opening the tap at the other end of the series. And nature organizes a ton of reactions in sequential pathways to get around these kinds of problems. So this is done by coupling reactions. And so there are some reactions that are highly favorable, highly exothermic, where you can really sort of guarantee flux through that enzyme. A lot of these uh, enzymes are ATP dependent. 
they use and burn ATP so you get a lot of energy out and they drive the flux through enzyme one by enzyme two being an exergonic reaction while enzyme one is endergonic. So flux is guaranteed. And a lot of pathways are sort of set up to be in this way with this uh, coupling of uh, the chemistries. Okay, so what else? Um, so what we find is that enzymes, first of all, work in pathways where they are co-located in certain places. Uh, they may be, for example, uh, co-localized to certain organelles in a human cell. They may be co-localized in the mitochondria or in an, uh, some organelle. And we'll talk more about organelles and mitochondria later. They could be co-localized at a membrane. And so you ensure that the enzymes are together by putting them in the same place. And then nature also evolves ways where the enzymes physically interact with each other, either covalently or non-covalently. So they could be associated in the pathway by some kind of non-covalent interaction, or you may actually link enzymes to make them single species. So if this is enzyme one, and this is enzyme two, here you have an enzyme one, enzyme two, single long polypeptide chain that has two domains. They can't get away from each other because they're joined covalently and they catalyze sequential reactions. This just doesn't happen with just three enzymes. It can happen with 10 enzymes or more. So they're very clever ways to ensure that flux occurs through pathways. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but don't forget all along that each of these enzymes is responsible for a single transformation. That's important. There's another phenomenon that having flux through pathways is very useful for, is to deal with toxic intermediates. Because that makes it very advantageous, again, to couple reactions. So let's say product B is toxic. We don't want it hanging around much. We don't want it released from an enzyme to go do damage somewhere in the cell. So having flux through a pathway basically ensures the B never gets out of the game. It just goes straight to enzyme two. So that's another, another physical advantage of those processes being linked together. And finally, the process also ensures a very nice opportunity to do regulation. So here we, on this slide, I show you this sort of mega mess of metabolic pathways in physiology. That there would be the, uh, the Krebs cycle, but all the metabolic pathways that are all interlinked. And many of these pathways will be co-localized, steps in these pathways will be co-localized as clusters. And so um, that deals, tells you how we can solve the equilibrium problem by linking enzymes for flux through pathways. And one of the best examples is in aerobic glycolysis, where in the early steps, they're not energetically favorable. You use ATP to start to break down glucose. Then you get to a certain intermediate where its conversion to a smaller molecule uh, generates ATP with very favorable reactions. So glycolysis is a, a, a really great example of this. Now, the other thing that I just want to describe to you is the issue of uh, feedback. And I've described this here on this slide. And so we'll talk about it on this slide. So if we are working with a pathway that goes through multiple steps to make an end product, five steps, three steps or whatever, 
and that you've made too much of that. You've already made a lot of that product and you don't need any more. Nature also has in place a regulatory uh, mechanism to feed back and stop flux through the pathway. You don't just stop all the enzymes, you find a way to stop the first enzyme. So this is a very important paradigm in uh, biochemistry and that's called negative feedback. So I'm showing you it here just in a very simple cartoon form in the isoleucine biosynthesis pathway. That's one of the hydrophobic amino acids. This is an intermediate that is on its way from this amino acid that is polar but not charged threonine. So threonine gets converted to isoleucine. We need threonine to make isoleucine. But once we got a lot of isoleucine, it, it binds to the very first enzyme in the pathway Pathway and acts as an allosteric regulator that dampens activity. So in this case, I just want to point out to you that I'm showing a very common way we notate things. When we are talking about inhibiting a reaction, we draw it like this. We align and then align to the, to the arrow, to st which means you've stopped the activity. So you'll see this again and again. You're going to see it a lot in signaling pathways because things often feed back. So another thing that nature ensures, in addition to not building up toxic products and dealing with equilibria, is that you don't want a ton of enzymes working to make something you don't need anymore. So you might as well take the end product and use it to stop the first enzyme, as that end product becomes scarce, it dissociates from the first enzyme and it turns the pathway back on again. And I think that's a really neat way of making that happen. And also, in these cases, the enzymes have to be clustered as a group because you wouldn't get those local concentrations to be so advantageous if the enzymes weren't co-localized. Does that make sense? If they weren't in a really near location, the enzyme that produces isoleucine, that isoleucine couldn't bind back to the first enzyme in the pathway if they were in different compartments of the cell. Okay? Everyone good with that? Good. All right. Okay, so now we are moving on to carbohydrates. Hmm. It's a pretty strange word, carbohydrate, but actually it relates to early findings that glucose is a carbohydrate and its molecular formula is C6H12O6. So they called it a hydrate of carbon before when they knew the elemental composition, but they didn't know anything about the structure. There's a lot of carbohydrates that don't, behave, don't obey this rule, but that's where the name comes from, a hydrate of carbon. All right. Now, carbohydrates are, account for, what did I have here? 25% of the mass of macromolecules, so a good amount. Uh, there are very, very important carbohydrates in central metabolism. We use carbohydrates as a source of energy, but also carbohydrates are a part of um, storage of energy in the form of polymeric structures that I'll describe to you. They're different ones in plants and in the humans. One is glycogen, one is cellulose. Um, uh, but carbohydrates have an increasingly important role in the extracellular matrix in these polymers that are wrapped around your cells and also as signaling entities both inside and outside the cell. So we used to think of carbohydrates and straight away connect this with metabolism, but the story is far greater than that. And I'll try to explain to you why, and it's because of the richness of functional groups in a carbohydrate. So the simplest carbohydrate, before I go up, there is a three carbon molecule. This would actually be called glyceraldehyde, but don't worry about that other name for it. It's a three carbon carbohydrate. And 
And this molecule um, would be called a triose. So we've got a couple of new, a new suffix. Because anything that is a carbohydrate ends with the suffix OSE. Not to be confused with the suffix ASE, which is an enzyme. So look carefully whether it's an A or an O, because it's the difference between a big protein that catalyzes a reaction and a carbohydrate. So a triose would be a carbohydrate with three carbons. They have an aldehyde, or let's just say they have a carbonyl functionality. So remember the, um, that there would be lone pair electrons on those OHs, similarly on these. And remember that each of these uh, vertices uh, corresponds to a carbon. Uh, uh, it's, um, the way you recognize carbohydrates is most commonly is that they are rich in carbon dash OH bonds, which are hydroxyls. which makes them polar molecules, likely to be highly solvated in water, and very different for the, from the compounds that are rich in just CH bonds that don't have such opportunities. So if you see a molecule and it's got a bunch of CHs but not a bunch of OHs, it's probably a lipid. If you see a, com a compound that's rich in OHs, it's likely to be a carbohydrate. Uh, the story gets a little bit more interesting as we move up to some of the different carbohydrates, which I've shown you there on that screen, and I'm gonna go forward to talk about those. Because this triose is important in primary metabolism. Um, we break down carbon, uh, carbohydrates that have six sugars to small carbohydrates that have three, excuse me, carbohydrates that have six carbons to carbohydrates that have three carbons. And that's where these three carbon entities crop up. But I want to focus you in on two sets of carbohydrates, the hexoses and the pentoses. So we immediately know they're carbohydrates, right, OSE. The hexoses obviously have six carbons, and the pentoses have five carbons. And these are the most important of the carbohydrates. Yes, there are carbohydrates with four carbons, and then there are ones with seven, eight, nine carbons, but these are the ones we'll totally focus on in 7016 because these are very important in different biopolymers. And the hexoses are important components, for example, of cellulose, and glycogen, but where are the pentose carbons? And where are they so important? Actually, I need to draw this as its straight chain version because I'll drive you crazy. So this sugar here is a pentose, one, two, three, four, five carbons, bunch of OHs, aldehyde at one end. Commonly, carbohydrates will fold up into a cyclic structure through an equilibrium. I won't worry you too much with the chemistry, but I'm just gonna show you that structure. It looks like this, a five-membered ring. So this, the interconversion of these two is an equilibrium process. And those carbohydrates are incredibly important. Where? Yeah. Acid. Nucleic acids. So your phosphodiester backbone is attached to sugars that are attached to, uh, uh, to um, purines and pyrimidines. And we'll see those structures later. But it, absolutely essential feature of that polymer is the five-membered ring carbohydrates that are known as ribose, which is what that guy is, and two deoxyribose, where one of the hydroxyls is actually a hydrogen, it's not a hydroxyl, and it's this one. So instead of being an OH, it's a, an H. And we number carbohydrates, and you'll, I'll reinforce this much more when we talk about carbohydrate, about nucleic acids. There's a numbering system. So 2-deoxyribose is in your DNA, 
And ribose itself is in your RNA, okay? So obviously we need to worry about carbohydrates and learn a little bit about them based on that key criterion. Okay, let's move now to the hexosis. I'm not gonna make you keep drawing hexoses and things. I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about them uh, with respect to their structures. So I've shown you on the board the cyclic form of a pentose. This is the linear form and the cyclic form. Let me write that down. And by the way, in your DNA, it's always in the cyclic form. It's not in the linear form. And the hexoses also have a linear and a cyclic form. And I show you that equilibrium for glucose. You see six carbons. I've got them numbered. And they form favorably into this six-membered ring. Uh, this is the cyclic form of glucose. This is the linear form of glucose. When glucose associates into polymers, it becomes these things like cellulose or glycogen. And it depends a lot on the linkages in those polymers to define which one it is. Now, as I mentioned, carbohydrates aren't always um, are just a series of OH groups. Uh, there's sometimes other functionality. So I'm just gonna quickly draw those. And if you've got them on your uh, handout, you can uh, play along with me here. So, um, sometimes there's an NH2 there. That's called glucosamine, very creatively. Sometimes that NH2 is converted to an amide, like that bond in a peptide, so it's glucosamide, right? And sometimes, so you can draw these on your handout because the six-member rings are there. This stays as an OH, but this OH here is at a different oxidation state. Don't worry about that terminology, but what's important, it's glucuronic acid. So it can be negatively charged, positively charged, neutral. So there are variations on a lot of our hexoses, basically meaning this carbohydrate molecular formula doesn't work anymore, but the term is stuck, all right? So there's quite a variety of different carbohydrates with slight differences. And the intriguing thing is that the carbohydrates that you and I use in all of our physiologic processes are much simpler than the carbohydrates that bacteria use. There's an expansion of like 10 to the two or 10 to the three in the variety of sugars that bacteria use. Uh, and that's definitely a story for another day. So let me now move on to thinking about carbohydrates, not as the monomers, that you metabolize, but rather as the polymers that are involved in many other different types of processes. And when we think about the polymers, we wanna think about how their polymers differ from the polymers uh, of nucleic acids or proteins, because this will tell you why carbohydrates are so complicated, right? When you make, take a bunch of amino acids and make a polymer, it's a linear polymer, right? Every unit is joined to the next by an amide. There's no branching there. It's just a linear polymer. So the diversity is not enormous, or it's pretty enormous, but it's not as big as it could be if it were a branched polymer with different types of side chains. We will see next week that the polymers of the nucleic acids, here's the basic structure. There's the ribose, by the way. The R could be an OH or an H attached to a base, a purine or pyrimidine. You don't need to know that yet. You'll know it next week. And then to a phosphate. But those, again, are linear polymers. You only have, you don't have branching. You just have a single continuous chain. The crazy thing about sugars is they can branch from any of those OHs. So there's much more diversity um, of structure and function within, with, wrapped in the carbohydrates, which makes them real trouble to study. Okay, I want to now introduce you to a, another feature. The other thing is when we join amino acids or we join uh, nucleic acid building blocks, nucleosides, there's no difference in the shapes that we can form. We don't have variety there, but in sugars, we can make different kinds of linkages depending on how two OH groups in a sugar are joined. So for example, if you join two glucoses, 
in this kind of linkage, that would give you maltose, but if you join two glucoses in that kind of linkage, it would give you lactose, and those are different compounds. They serve different types of physiologic roles. Um, and uh, there are enzymes that will make these bonds, and then enzymes that will break these bonds. There is a common uh, uh, disorder that people have as they grow older, the enzyme that breaks the, lactase, the lactose bond uh, gets turned off, it doesn't work anymore, and that's the enzyme lactose. So when people um, are intolerant to sugars, lactose is the sugar in milk, and they can't digest dairy products because lactase doesn't work anymore or you can take supplements. So that's how that relates to physiology. Uh, the reaction between two glucoses to make the disaccharide is actually a condensation because when you join that bond, you kick out water as a side product or when you break that bond, you release water. So this is another one of the condensation reactions. So underline that on the slide, because a condensation means a reaction that proceeds and produces you a molecule of water, okay? All right. And uh, this just sums up the lactase problem where you can't digest lactose, the milk sugar. Okay, so those are monomers. Now let's think about polymers and complex structures of sugars. Um, and I put these all on the slides because it's just impossible for you to keep drawing them. And I'm just gonna give you sort of one of my uh, pet peeves. <laughs> <laughs> I draw sugars like this. A lot of other people draw sugars like that. <laughs> And I don't like that because this is what they look like. So if you see this and you go, I haven't seen sugars looking like that before, it's because this is the way to draw them that actually represents their shape. So if it's unusual format to you, I'm not going to ask you to construct these. I just want you to be familiar with looking at them like this rather than like this, because to me, that's the best way to render them, all right? Okay, so polymers of sugars. I just mentioned to you there are polymers of sugars that are important as storage. So when we have excess glucose, we store glucose as glycogen. In the it's often stored in the liver. And later on in the semester, we'll see how a bolt of adrenaline uh, sets all the processes in motion to chew up glycogen, to release more glucose, so you can have a lot of energy quickly. So in that, uh, in that polymer, the sugars are linked in a different way. Uh, the common polymer in plants, and in fact um, accounts for a massive proportion of the biomass, is a different polymer of glucose where the linkages are beta, we would call this a beta linkage, but that's the way it looks, and that would be cellulose, and it's a linear polymer coming down here. Glycogen is often a branched polymer with different kinds of linkages with different aspects or different shapes. So the glycogen that we store and can break down in order to produce glucose to make energy is glycogen. We cannot break down cellulose. We don't digest plant cellulose because we don't have those enzymes, which is why we don't get nutritional value out of the cellulose the same way we can, we can uh, put the forces in action to break down glucose. So the way those bond looks, bonds look is absolutely critical for how you can use the energy that's within them by using enzymes to break those bonds. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in general, uh, I've just said that, glucose can be stored as cellulose or as uh, glycogen. Uh, the process of photo, um, photosynthesis converts energy and sunlight into, glu um, into glucose, um, and then you can make uh, the polymers of glucose. And what I'm showing you here in these polymers is uh, a simplified view. I want to introduce to you one other term, and that term is glycan. And that basically refers to something that is more than one sugar, one carbohydrate. Uh, 
I was looking at the videos of my lectures, and I realized my handwriting is horrible. So I'm, I'm really trying very hard to make it a little bit neater today. So glycan is just the name for a polymer of sugars, but they can also be called polysaccharides. Um, but glycan now is the commonly accepted term for a lot of sugars. Now, I've told you about energy storage. I've told you about simple disaccharides and monosaccharides in metabolism. But what I want to do now is give you a little overview of all the different places where sugars feature in a cell. Because I think it's really important to realize that sugars form a, a great sort of a set of uh, molecules for communication. So I'm going to go around this sort of funny looking square cell. Um, and this would be a eukaryotic cell because it's got a nucleus and there are different compartments. So within the cell, um, the cell sits in what's known as an extracellular matrix. It's a meshwork of uh, sugar polymers that actually is important for the cells and important for trapping signals that come from cells and go to other cells. So those are all uh, predominantly made up of carbohydrate. The next thing to look at is that there are, sugar, there are proteins within the cell that can become modified with a sugar and go to the nucleus or leave the nucleus. So there is a type of signaling that is based on adding a sugar or taking it off a protein. We'll see later in the semester how also phosphorylation does a lot of functions that look like that. There are sugars that are displayed on cell surface polymers. And that's where signaling becomes important because sugars may be attached to lipids. Do you remember we've talked about phospholipids being part of the membrane? Sugars can be attached to lipids that sit in the membrane and face out. And it's how cell-cell uh, -cell communication occurs in some instances. Or they may be attached to proteins that are also displayed on the surface of the cell. So this tells you a little bit about where we put these sugars is what's responsible for communication because they're, they're on the surface of the cell with their uh, sides out. Uh, and then uh, the final thing I want to talk about is the blood group system. So uh, a lot of you may be aware of blood groups. Uh, there are four principal blood groups. And those, the differences between the blood in A, B, AB, and O blood groups are differences in just the sugars that are attached to the surface of the cell. So let me describe those, and then we'll talk about blood groups and things that are being done to enhance the supplies of uh, red blood cells in cases of emergency. I have a nice little video I'm hoping to get to. So on the surface of the cell, you might have different sugars. This is a trisaccharide. All right, you can see one, two, three sugars. They have different linkages, but you can pick out the sugars, and they are joined by a bond called a glycoside bond. And those join sugars. So what do you think the enzyme that cleaves the glycoside is? Glycosidase. <laughs> glycosidase. You would say glycosidase. I would say glycosidase. But they are the same thing. <laughs> so. And that's going to be pertinent in a minute. So remember, if in doubt, guess and stick A's at the end if I ask you the name of an enzyme, because that works pretty well. So if you have O blood group, you would have exclusively this trisaccharide on your red blood cells. If you have the A blood group, you have an extra sugar attached to that trisaccharide, and it's a glucosamine, a glucosamide sugar. There's an extra uh, carbonyl group. 